Well, hello there, and welcome to SkyTour Livestream for today, the 9th of March. Uh, I'm Mark D'Antonio, and we have Amanda here in the background with us, and we have Daryl Mason on with us as well. See, two of your favorite people, and then me. So I think this is pretty cool. Uh, I want to welcome everybody who's joined us already in the chat. Thanks for coming along. I see we have uh, Marco and Kenneth, the boss gamer. That's cool. I don't know. Kenneth, I haven't seen you before. And Marco, I think you were here a couple times. MTX, here he is. Oh, Marco's regular. Yeah, I, I haven't, I haven't. like I said, until I had my stream up, like or my uh, chat box along with everything else, I've never been able to see uh, the chat, especially when I used to be in the observatory. When I was in the observatory mm -hmm. all the time, I just never had a, a way to see it, you know. Um, and and Marco's always here, as he says, and I'm 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 glad that you are. Uh, all right, let me uh, just bring us up here. We are actually going to do something a little different tonight. Here's why: uh, I had the observatory open, had the telescope up and running, everything was great, and it was beautifully clear. I went inside for 15 minutes, and when I came out, it was totally cloudy. Now, no lie, but it doesn't mean we don't have a stream tonight because we do. What we're gonna do is something called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Map. What is that? It's something we've talked about before, but it allows us many different ways to see the moon uh, using this online system. Now it's changed even since the last time we used it. So I think it's gonna be a little bit uh, uh, more of a trick. Uh, for you to uh, use it now if you haven't used it since the last time we talked. Uh, but, you know, or, or if you used it the way I used to teach how you used it, uh, now we're going to teach a different way. Uh, this will help you, you know. Uh, and this is not a real uh, uh, real picture, of course. This is a zoomable map of the moon, uh, complete with some really interesting uh, details of places on the moon, which include the lunar landing sites. So we're going to check those out as well. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna check it out in just a minute. I just have to set a couple more things, and away we go. Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. See, for the moon tonight, we have blue lights on, because this is the moonlight view. All right. Uh, so there's our moonlight view. We've got our blue light on. Uh, it's kind of a mood light, isn't it, Daryl? Wouldn't you say? Sure. All right. I want a blue light in my room. I um, want a lava lamp. Oh, I, I have one. <laughs> I, have I always wanted a lava lamp. I want a purple one. A I, purple I, one? Purple, yeah. purple liquid or purple, purple oil? Purple, purple uh, goo. I don't know. I'll know it when I see it. Purple goo, probably. Well, purple it's just, goo sounds good. I mean, you can actually make one. It's just paraffin. Yeah. <clears throat> and if you dribbled paraffin into a uh, a Coke bottle, and then set that Coke bottle on top of a stand that had a you know a, a 25 watt light in it, yeah. uh, then it would become a lava lamp. That's all it takes. It's I so want cool. one of those plasma thingies too. Oh, I got one of those. Oh, I even sure have these do. small ones. The small, <laughs> Daryl. I have these small discs. They're only about three inches across. And, and they're only little discs, and they actually are the same little thing. You can run your fingers on them and make a bzzz, or the same thing. And they also have the globe, you know. So it's really cool. I love it, you know. So, yes, I, I was telling you guys, uh, this is the moon uh, as seen by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, just a few, let me just show you the layout because this is neat. <clears throat> I don't know how long this stream will go. Uh, we can go as long or as short as people want. But we're not going to overdo it and, and, and do it to death. We're just going to, uh, I'll show you the basics and then uh, you'll, be go, you'll be able to go do it and take it, uh, do it yourself. I just, show, just, show you, yeah, just to show you where it is, uh, my uh, address bar up top, you probably can't read it, but it says quick, quick map, Q U I C K M A P dot L R O C dot A S U dot E D U. All right, and you, you don't have to remember that, uh, but if you put that in the stream, as Amanda just did, actually, thank you, uh, then you can actually go to it yourself and then navigate around. But let me show you how you can do it so it'll be really, really helpful. 
All right, so here's what we do. Uh, when you first start it up, this is what you see. Now, uh, currently the moon is, an, it's a young moon as we call it. It's, it's only just beginning its cycle, all right? And up at the top left here, we have these little icons in the quick map browser, all right? And we have uh, this one here. This is the map projection. We have orthographic far side, which looks like this. This is the far side of the moon, okay? Notice it has many more craters than the front side of the moon. We'll talk about that a little. Then we have the near side, which we're all used to seeing, okay? Then we have uh, a different projection, which is a cylindrical projection of the moon. All right, uh, it's called a it's called an equidistant cylinder. Uh, and then we actually have the south pole of the moon, which is very interesting. That was the rabbit on the moon you showed a second ago. It was. Yeah. Usagi. Uh, not Usagi. The other one, the one I like. There you go. Head to the left, ears over the top, feet toward the bottom, and cottontail to the right. I mean, this is the cottontail? Uh, oh, what is it? Merichrysium, the round one? This guy? A little farther down. Oh. There you go. Yeah, you had all the seas on the front side of the moon visible. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's his head on the left, the long, skinny, dark line over the top. That's his ears over his back now this is the uh, to the lower left those are his front feet to the, the right are his feet. rear legs and back feet and the uh, round the moon merichrysium i think uh, that's his cotton tail <laughs> that is so cool and we used to think it was a man in the moon we didn't yeah. even know it was a bunny it's a bunny in the moon i'm sorry mark carry on i'm just blathering here no i no, I, I, I love that Daryl, that was great i like that but I was saying before, and as I go on to this, this is the South Pole. And what's interesting about the South Pole is that some of these craters never get light in them. No matter how the moon cycle goes, there's never any light that makes it into some of these craters. One of these craters uh, is named... Explain that. Well, because they're deep and the moon, the moon light is only... Actually, the sunlight is only ever on an edge here because the way the moon is oriented, you know. The light hits the, the other sides of the moon. This is the bottom of the moon, basically. And the sun is directly this way, you know, or this way or this way, but it's never below the moon. So it never gets into these craters. So they're perpetually in darkness. They have been for billions of years, but we have actually... Has anyone ever visited that? We did with, no. the, with the L-Cross mission. We dropped something into one of these because one of the ideas was that maybe there was water vapor or water rather, that was in the uh, soil, okay? And if that was the case, then that means that we might be able to see that there was water in these craters. And if there was, it meant that that was probably a likely place to set up a lunar base when we get there, because we need water. And we're gonna find water on the moon. It's the pr that was the predominant thinking. Well, it turned out, <laughs> it turned out that the water uh, is uh, fairly prevalent in the regolith, that is the lunar soil, anyway. So uh, it's no longer it's no longer a thing where they had to worry about that. It, tr it turns out that there's water almost everywhere else on the moon, anyway, and that's a good thing, you know. Uh, very cool. Yeah. That's called the Aitken Basin, isn't it, Mark? Not here. Uh, I can show you the Aitken Basin. It's on the far side. Oh. Yeah. We have some questions coming in. Okay. See, these are um, these are the permanently shadowed regions. And, of course, Elrock's uh, browser shows oh, it to you. Thank you, Raymond. Oh, Raymond. Hey, thanks, man. Thank goodness. Oh, we've got the greatest viewers on the in the planet. You know that? We really do. It's these people are so great. It's so humbling every time yeah. anyone ever makes the effort to support us. We really appreciate it. I do. I mean, Raymond, he, he has, if, if, if we never saw a contribution from Raymond in the next two years, that would be fine, you know, considering what he's given us in the past. You know, fantastic. But thank you, Raymond. That's fantastic. So, yeah, this, this uh, 
if you, if you can let me know the questions if you want to, because I'm just showing the, these are the permanently shadowed regions, uh, and LROC's quick map browser shows you, okay? And we sent a, a probe down, not a probe, but a, a, we dumped a, uh, a, uh, let me just do the nomenclature here to show you. Uh, we dumped a, uh, stage of a rocket into this crater right here, Cabius. Okay. And Cabius is, again, a permanently shadowed crater, and we dropped it in there and then looked at the spectrum of the dust and debris that was thrown up from that impact of this uh, rocket expended stage. And it showed that, indeed, there is water. But as I said, we found out later that there's water everywhere else on the moon, too, tied in with the lunar soil. So that was actually a very good thing, you know. Uh, and, and those... You know, that to me, that, that speaks volumes because that tells us now that we can go anywhere on the moon. We don't have to just go to the south pole of the moon or the north pole of the moon, you know. So what you were going to ask me a question or someone had a question, Amanda? Uh, we have a few questions coming in, yeah. Okay. Um, well, first off, uh, I don't know if it was on this screen or the last um, Ace wanted to know what the stuff in the middle of the crater on the right side was. Oh, I think we probably want to... But I think, yeah, I think that was on the last. Hey, and welcome Dr. Mark in Texas. Um, yes, I, I did <clears throat> I did tell you um, about the uh, compression artifacts. There was a video from another YouTube channel uh, where... They were purporting that they were seeing structures on the moon. But, of course, they were zooming way in. Uh, and when you zoom way in, um, you see artifacts, uh, which I can show you, actually. Uh, let's go back to a projection that we know. With the graphic near side, you're going to see lots of nomenclature as well. <clears throat> nomenclature, as in names. But if we zoom in, what's neat is if you look down at the bottom here, you can see the scale. Okay, this is 250 meters per pixel. That means per tiny picture element, it's 250 meters. So it's not a very good scale. But if we go over here and we go to this crater, Herschel, uh, and we go uh, zipping in and go right down in here. Okay, now you can see we are now at 2 meters per pixel. Okay, which is beautiful. And we zoom in even more, <clears throat> and we can see that it's a little fuzzy, but it's a half meter per pixel. The basically what that means is that the smallest little dots here, and this like these reflections, <clears throat> the smallest dots you can see are pixels, and they're each about a half meter in size. We can see something reasonably that's about 20 feet across, maybe 30 feet across. All right, um, and we can see. Uh, distended objects like trails left by boulders rolling down a hill uh, as well so quite easily so uh, this is how this browser works it's beautiful and of course you're at the mercy of how the light was at the time the picture was taken uh, and uh, but it's still really pretty you know so see how that works now when we pull out okay of the crater okay this is Ptolemaeus here you know, and you look at the crater, you say, wow, look at this. You zoom in, all right? And you can see that you can see that there's actually uh, this fuzziness here. Again, we're at the limit of the resolution of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter here, all right? And for some imagery, there isn't data, all right, that's this detailed. This is the size of the pixel for that other data. And pixels are just one color. But if we zoom out, you'll see how this data, as you zoom out, becomes better looking because we're seeing it from farther away. Okay, But as we zoom in, this area has higher resolution data. This does not. <clears throat> so as we get closer, um, you could be mistaken for thinking you see structures here. You know, um, you know, And you could be forgiven for thinking you see them. If you don't know anything about image compression and how it works, well, then you could be forgiven. And if you take a picture of the moon and you're not using very high resolution or, or 
you don't have the capability to see high resolution. When you get the, or you get an image off, off your camera, what you're looking at is something that's being compressed by the camera so that you can actually see it in any reasonable amount of time. If you did this at a real full uh, magnification resolution, um, then you would probably have to wait many minutes to get that image because it would take a long time to download to be a long time to see it. Okay, so to see things in a reasonable amount of time, camera makers, you know, have crossed a, a little barrier. They said, well, we can't, we can't actually give you the data that's very, very high resolution. We have to compress it first or you'll never see it. It's going to take a long time to come in. And that won't be a good consumer camera. Who's going to want that? So <clears throat> in order to make cameras that work for the wedding photographer as well as the astronomer, uh, the cameras have settings and sensors that uh, will eventually end up with a compressed result. And so when you zoom in on a compressed result, you get this pixelation here. All right. And this is not the same kind of pixelation that I'm telling you that I was talking about a moment ago, but it gives you the idea uh, of what we see. And that, that's, this is kind of the same thing. Pixels are only ever just one color. Okay. So you can see uh, medium gray, lighter gray, slightly darker gray, very dark gray, slightly not. See, and together, they add up together to make a picture. All right. And you need many of them to do that. So to get that photo of the crater, look how many pixels are in here. Okay. We've got one, two, three, four. I could go on about 70 to 80 to 100 pixels all making up that one crater. And as we zoom out, of course, even more. So that's how that works. Uh, and that's why we don't see it uh, you know, with this kind of resolution because it didn't have that kind of resolution when the picture was taken. Look at this. You know, So here we are. This is half meter per pixel. You can see this scale down here when you zoom in. So you can see these little boulders. These boulders are actually really um, quite large, but these smaller ones aren't. These smaller ones here are probably in the range of, of about a meter in size. And that's pretty good, you know, to see uh, that. Now, when we look at uh, stuff on the moon uh, at this resolution, uh, you know, it's not like we can see it perfectly clear because the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was between 30 and 60 miles above the moon when it took this picture. That's a lot closer to the moon than it could have gotten to the Earth, say, if it was looking at the Earth because it would have been well within the atmosphere at that point. Um, you know, the space station is at 250 plus uh, miles above the Earth. And at that height, uh, the L rock, this, this, the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter wouldn't have been able to see much. You know, here's what's interesting, though. Okay, this is a crater, right? Uh, I'm just going to point out something interesting. This is not uh, a complex crater. It's actually a fairly uh, uh, reasonable sized crater. It's a smaller crater. It's called a simple crater because it has just a, a bowl shape. It's flat on the bottom here only because there's debris that came down the sides and, and kind of washed into the bottom, see? Right, sort of washed into the bottom here. And I say washed as if it's water, but it's not. Uh, it's the, It tumbled, and every time there was an impact on the moon elsewhere, it would vibrate these walls and stuff would tumble down. You can see the stuff, that, the stuff that's yet to be buried. Uh, has tumbled down in here. This is just a shadow, this black part. Okay, so when you look at this, if you go to the edges of the crater, we see the same kind of thing on Mars too, right where the crater, uh, where, where the, the uh, impactor had uh, you know, struck and then gouged out a, a huge chunk of the moon here. We see that near the edges where it didn't penetrate uh, into this uh, far enough region here, there's some exposed bedrock here. This is the strata under the moon's surface, see? This is under the moon's surface. This isn't at the top. This isn't right on the crater only. This is under the surface. So below the surface of the moon, there's this, this uh, strata. And, of course, the impact has warped it and changed it. But uh, this is why when we go to Mars, uh, we looked at all that strata sticking out uh, from the crater walls because it tells us a lot about the evolution of Mars. We're going back in history on the moon by looking in here, you know, 
And that's kind of interesting. Now you might say, well, how far down the crater wall is that? How far do we, is that? Is there a way to find out? Well, we could go find the size of Ammonius Crater, okay? And if we got the size of Ammonius Crater, then we can actually uh, figure out uh, how uh, far down the crater wall it was and then figure out the slope and all that. But why bother to do that when we have tools within this Quick Map browser to do that? Oh, yes, we do. And where we see this draw slash search tool, okay, if you click on that, now you have three things. You can think of a point, an arc, or a polygon. Let's do an arc. And let's do this. Let's go over here and let's draw a line from right here all the way across the crater. All right. Now we'll double click. And now look, we're seeing the shape of the crater. Okay. And one of the new features they've added is a detailed chart. Okay. And now this is a chart. Okay. This is the, uh, this is the size in uh, kilometers across the bottom. So we took, we drew a line that's approximately 8.2 kilometers in size. Okay. And now if we want to look at this other area, this part that I was talking about before, okay, right here, all right, right there. That tells us if you look over on right here on this part of the screen where the cursor is right there, that tells you the depth across the crater, the depth on the moon at which that bedrock occurs. And I see this is the bedrock right here I'm talking about, okay? So we move the cursor and we see it right there. On the right, you see that yellow circle. And where is that? If we look at our depth meter right here, it tells us that that it's occurring approximately 600 and feet, uh, what's that, what's that, 600, 600 and, uh, uh, say from the start, it's like from 471 feet, um, I'm sorry, meters down to uh, 573. So for about 100 meters, this this bedrock layer uh, has been exposed and it's also saying that from this point here the bedrock layer is like 471 meters uh, below the surface that is the mean radius of the moon and that's not you know that that's not necessarily here okay if we go right to that edge it says we're already by the time we're at that edge right where we first start like at the top of the crater we're already minus 365 so how can that be? Shouldn't it be zero, you might ask? Well, the reason is that the all the measurements of the crater depths and so forth on the moon are based on what's called the mean radius. Uh, think of it as uh, a radius that works everywhere for the moon. So there'll be, there'll be radii. Sort of like, huh? sort of like sea, sea level, isn't it? Analogous to sea level? In a sense. In a sense, yes, exactly. Um, so, um, but there's no real sea level on the moon, so they have something called the mean radius, uh, yes. and that's sort of a—I uh, don't want to call it an average because the mean's not an average, but roughly thinking, it's an average radius. Okay, and it's agreed upon value for the radius of the moon. So you'll find some craters that are way above the mean radius all the way throughout, or way below. All throughout and this is one of those craters that's, that's below throughout all right at its deepest okay look at that it's it's 2143 meters okay below sea level up <laughs> below the mean radius of the moon all right Sorry. <laughs> no you got me <laughs> and then uh, at the top of the of the crater it's minus 365 or so maybe a little less minus uh, 353 um, uh, meters below the mean radius of the moon to start with so really uh it's this crater here if you want to say it is is just under 2000 meters below uh the uh the lunar surface here okay but that's a huge amount that's a large crater so and we do that from this this tool here the draw and search tool now you're not constrained to have just that one we can actually uh, go and make another one okay so this path here is ours that we had so we can open it like that or we can actually uh, 
you know, uh, make another one. All right. And so uh, we can do that. And but I want to show you something. And the reason why this looks like a straight line, but it looks like it says it, it's an arc. Well, let's show you why you can make it an arc. OK, if I were to draw this line larger, OK, let's let's say we're going to draw here. Let's say we're going to measure Plato, this crater. OK, so watch this. When I draw the arc now, OK, when I draw the line, the longer I draw the line, OK, notice this isn't a straight line. It's an arc. It's actually following the curvature of the moon. You see? So let's do this again, but now uh, just for like, say, the uh, for Plato. So here's Plato. All right. Let's go from, say, the outside across the center and stop over here. Okay. So here is our view over here. So uh, this part here where Plato, where it's off the wall over here, okay, we're looking at minus 1,337 below, uh, meters below the lunar mean radius. Then it drops down to minus 2,534 meters below the mean radius and 528. And then it comes racing back up again uh, and then ends up being Okay, at this point, minus 696. What's that mean? It means at this end of the crater, okay, at minus uh, 1100 or so, say it right out here, is at minus uh, 1060, let's see what's over there, minus 1300 plus. And this is only minus uh, 600 at this point. So it shows you that this is a lower area and this is a higher area, all right? And so when people say, well, aren't the craters all the same heights and, and depths? No, they're certainly not. Okay. All right. Pl uh, in fact, Plato right here in the middle is minus 1,523. Uh, I'm sorry, minus 2,520 uh, meters below the lunar mean radius. Okay. And if we do another crater, all right, let's say, let's take another one. Uh, let's say this one, Bliss. All right, let's go through that one, okay? And then we get our profile there. Well, Bliss is 4,390 meters below mean sea level. It's way deeper than this gun, all right? So you see that all the craters are different depths, uh, you know, and that's, I think, very important to understand, all right? And I, we get that crater a lot. People say, well, you know, why are, they, why are they all the same depths? They're not. And why are they flat on the bottom? Well, they're not. Okay, when you look at Plato, okay, Plato is flat, roughly looking flat. Okay, it's actually an arc. It's curved because it's so big. It's 60 miles across. But if you were to take this crater and look at it in a, in a close-up, okay, let's do that. All right, let's just grab a section of the bottom. Okay, all right, just a section of the bottom. Check that out. Okay, it is anything but flat. It is going up and down all over the place. Why? Because we're looking. Well, let's go look. I'll show you. As we get closer, look what we're seeing. There are craters all throughout. And there's craters within craters, micro craters, very tiny craters. Even down to the highest resolution, we see craters throughout Plato. See that? Tons of craters. Lots of craters. So this is why... Uh, you know, when people say, oh, it's flat and it's just all barren and featureless. Well, it's barren for sure. Okay. There's no trees and no lakes. All right. But there's plenty of canyons. There's plenty of other uh, stuff to see on, on, the, on the moon. And it's anything but featureless, really. Okay. Because look at this. We have craters. Look at these. The tiniest craters have craters within them. You know, in, in most cases. So we're looking at a whole lot of uh, data here, a lot of detail. All right. There's a lot going on in these basins. Uh, and because it looks like this, because, you know, the LRO, the Lunar Quick, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, it creates strips. It goes across the, uh, they're called footprints, and it goes across the moon and creates these strips of photography like these strips here. OK. 
Okay, this strip was not as high resolution as this strip. So if we zoom in, okay, we'll see. Let's see if I get closer here. Um, this strip is actually, uh, yeah, this strip is is less. Uh, uh, it's slightly less uh, resolution than this one. See how detailed we can see there? Here it's kind of fuzzy. See, so we're not seeing it in the same resolution. It's slightly less. Um, and that just has to do with the way the orbit was, the way the light was. Okay, if you notice the light on this crater here, the light's coming from below down here and hitting into the crater here. Well, here the light is different. The light is coming from over here, aiming this way. See? So the, it was taken at two different types of light as well because it, these were taken at different parts of the moon's cycle. Okay? You know? But, and again, as we get down here, there's still good resolution. This is another simple crater, all right? It has a bottom that's filled in with debris that has sifted down from these, these gently sloping walls over the course of the eons. As other impacts hit, it vibrated the stuff down and it tends to fill the interior. Uh, other impacts would throw out ejecta, you know, that would end up landing on the walls and then the, on the walls of the crater, which would then sift down. So it's really, a lot of that happens, you know, it, it happens quite a bit, you know. Now, when we did the lunar stream, you saw um, uh, lunar eclipse stream, you actually watched the meteor hit the moon. So the meteors haven't stopped hitting the moon. They still hit the moon. I was about to say, that was one of our questions way back from Gas Mask. Right. Why do you never see videos of meteors hitting the moon? Oh, that's because you haven't it watched our perfect, previous stream. <laughs> yeah, it was a perfect lead-in, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, thanks, Gas Mask. Yeah, it's it's cool, and and I think that um, if you look at that uh, meteor, I'm sorry, that lunar eclipse stream, you'll see. Uh, I even give the uh, coordinates of time and so forth. You can actually see exactly when the meteor strikes the moon, and it shows up as a little flash, and eventually we might be able to see a special photo taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, this is what I've heard, uh, that will show that impact site. It was only a football-sized meteor, you know, or basketball-sized meteor, and the crater is probably only 40 feet across. But the impact speed, see, generated enough uh, conversion of that kinetic energy, the energy of motion, into heat that it showed on our camera as a brilliant flash for a split second. You know, and we caught it, and we're like so proud of that. It was great, and then that story went worldwide. Um, and you know, sure yeah, it sure did. You know, Mark, I have a question. <clears throat> sure. Uh, you just did away with it. That uh, profile diagram that was there on the left in that blue-gray box. Oh yeah. Uh, there are often two lines shown in that. The small crater you did earlier, there was like a blue or bluish green line and then a yellow line. And on that small crater, they seem to conform quite well. When you did the close-up there a while ago, you could see quite a difference between the blue line and the green line, or yes. excuse me, blue line and the yellow line. Uh, it looks like they're very close on that profile also. Well, that's because uh, we're, we're, we're also it, at a, a, a much larger scale. If I actually make this line smaller, Yes. You, you you may very well see exactly what you're uh, suspecting and that they won't be uh, fully aligned. You know, as the data gets better, uh, we'll we'll actually see uh, we'll see more uh, uh, more careful data. So right okay, here, like that right there. Uh, yeah. What is the difference between those two lines? Resolution. Okay, this green line is actually a higher resolution than the yellow one, um, and we're looking at interpolated data. Okay, the, the uh, yellow one, um, this is interpreted data. They interpolate the da distance between you know, more distant points that they took by looking at the moon. In the green lines, these are higher resolution. Uh, and these are actually uh, from, I believe, the 2015 uh, laser altimetry um, uh, uh, project that they did on the moon. Uh, and if we look at a detailed chart, this might show up better. Okay, so you see uh, this, and actually you can see that you sometimes it's very, it's very badly off, like here. Okay. Yes. It's showing it like minus two thousand five hundred fifty-five meters below lunar mean radius. Uh, yet 
it's really uh, only like 2,540. But if you look at the scale here, the scale here isn't that drastic. I mean, it looks like a huge difference here. But actually, the, the difference is only... Raymond said it again. Huh? Raymond said it again. Oh, Raymond, man, you're the coolest. You know, the difference is only, you know, uh, what, 10, 20? Okay, from where I was, let me look where they are. Yeah, it's only 15, you know, difference, 15 meters. So um, this points out the difference when we look at it at small, uh, at small uh, settings. Okay? okay. So we can turn it off or turn it on. You know, we can turn it off or turn it on. Okay. I, I choose the Lola. Okay, the Lola. See, it's the SL Digital Elevation Map. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. 2015. I couldn't see it at the uh, lower scale. Okay. Uh, on your uh, Skype screen. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, the sorry. The legend down at the bottom left. I get it. Yeah, okay. No, good. I'm glad you saw it. Yeah. Hey, Raymond, it's not a parking meter, man. You don't have to feed it every 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> That's funny, Daryl. That is good. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I appreciate these guys so much. They're, they're fantastic. I know, right? so humbling i know so let's come back out now for a minute i want to show you something else so we still have questions okay i'll, I'll pause i'll pause over Copernicus. well we had questions a while ago i asked one in like 45 minutes all later. right i'll wait go ahead i know i know i know but i don't want to fall too far behind no worries go um, for it. i'll stop and this this is for pictures of the real moon not not in the lro okay uh ace wants to know uh, can anyone explain to me the small but bright shiny dots on the moon? I'm not seeing it much right now, but when I have looked through my personal telescope, I always see them scattered about the moon. <clears throat> yeah. What is he saying, and what is it? Sure, I can explain that. Actually, we have a good uh, crater right here that will show us that. Uh, this crater right here, okay, that we're looking at, all right, uh, it's small, all right, but here's what's going on. Oh, figures this, the data is not complete for that one. Um, let's, uh, let me pick another one. I'll use it. It's okay. Um, so here's what happens. Uh, we can use this crater, I guess. If we look in this crater, you'll see that depending on how the light is, sometimes the way the photograph was taken, uh, we see that sometimes the, the, uh, well, in, even if you're looking live, uh, sometimes the reflection is coming directly back to your camera and to your eye from the sunlight that's hitting the moon and sometimes uh, it's not and so the areas where it is are going to be brighter and you can actually see some extremely bright areas Aristarchus is one of those places uh, and where's Aristarchus? Aristarchus is over here uh, okay here's Aristarchus crater and Aristarchus has a very very let's go back out just a little bit the lesser data this is called the Aristarchus Plateau. This actually, this whole area is the Aristarchus Plateau. And by plateau, what do I mean? Well, let's use our little tool and let's just go through uh, Herodotus and Aristarchus and go to here. And now you'll see what I mean. Okay, look at here is the area up here. This is this is actually um, the area of the, what I'm talking about. Okay, and then we come down. All right, we come off the uh, the uh, Aristarchus Plateau. This area here is higher elevation than the bottom of Aristarchus. But this whole area has this uh, uh, elevated uh, this elevated area here. All right, it's this elevated plateau. And uh, let me show it a little better. Let's do it by crossing right here. I'll do it right here. I'll start from here and come across to here. And now watch this area. Okay, and now you can see that down here, we're minus 1,642 meters. But then, as we rise up on the plateau, we get as high as 385 meters, or 355 meters above the lunar mean radius. Okay, uh, and that's actually, uh, actually 400 uh, right up there. So we actually, you know, then we come down. So this is the plateau caused by the impact that created Aristarchus. All right. And so the impactor hit. Now, it could have hit on a slight angle, okay, like here. And you might say, well, then wouldn't the crater be elliptical? And the answer is no. And 
you would say, well, how do you know that? And I can say, well, I can illustrate it for you with a little physics uh, test that you can do yourself. Go to a lake and skip a stone across the surface. In order for you to skip a stone across the surface of a lake, you've got to throw it very shallow and, and with a high energy. And when you do, every place that stone hits the water, it doesn't make an elliptical puddle, an elliptical ring. It makes a circular ring that radiates away from the moment of impact, that place where it impacted. That's the analogy for why all craters are round, okay? Or most craters are round. There are special cases. Yeah, most craters are round. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. That's fine. Uh, yeah, uh, Messier and Messier A over on the right. uh, the uh, west side or east side of the moon, I guess. Uh, that's a classic example of where it looks at least like one hit and bounced and hit again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, left rather uh, elliptical craters. Yeah. And there are a few others known. Yeah. Are we up here? Is that where this is? I know you, I'm trying to show you what uh, Daryl's talking about because it's actually a, a good a good question. Uh, am I in the wrong place here? Is he here? Uh, go He's a asking little for no comments, but I don't know how to ignore that. What's that? Oh, Raymond, man. He says no comments, please, but I don't know how you can ignore. I know, such hey, Raymond. Generosity. I can't ignore generosity like that, That's Raymond. That's too much, yeah. Wow. Where am I going, Daryl? I thought I was over. Uh, I think you need to go a little farther east to the next sea over. Okay. You might, might back out a little bit. Uh, over there, the one on the uh, the one below Americrisium, bottom left. Uh, bo blue. Bottom left? No, it's not over there. That's not where uh, Kep that's not where Messier is at. It's over here. I haven't looked. For, I haven't looked at Messier and the Moon in in years. Wow. It's it's over here somewhere. I'm sure I can find it. And I, there, and and when you're asking, well, where is it? Well, you know, we have a search feature too that we could use, and I'm gonna actually. Uh, I can use that. I will in a minute. I just okay. There it is. Okay. It didn't... Yeah, right where I said. Yeah, right where you said, <laughs> below Merichrysium. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, here's this is an example. Uh, but I want you to notice very carefully that there's a scar in the bottom of this nearly circular crater that's kind of got this elliptical look to it. Right now, it is it is an elliptically uh, elliptical uh, family of crater. There's no doubt. Okay, this one has a weird uh, look to it, and you might think, well, where did the thing come from? It came from a. It was a very mild blow on this on the moon. It went bam, bam. It bounced. Bow, bow, bow. When you say it bounced, we have to say, well, how far did it bounce? We know we can figure that out, because all we have to do is say, well, if it hit here. And then here, how far did it move? It actually bounced over 22 kilometers. See that? Center to center. So the object hit here, went airborne again, and then bounced here, uh, or, you know, again. Uh, and so a lot of the energy was dissipated here, a lot here. And it looks like it probably terminated here because it's also uh, plowed this, this little extra ridge uh, and that might have been uh, where it actually plowed itself under the moon um, but when it did that look what it did it shot out this uh, lunar material in this really long uh, ray uh, and we call those rays and you might say well how long is that ray system I'm glad you asked Go back to that tool again, found under the draw and search tool here, and click the right here at the base of Messier and move out to about where you can stop seeing it, which is about here actually. And we're looking at a distance of 151 kilometers that this material flew out there from this one impact. Well, that's a lot, but how could that happen? Well, it could happen very easily uh, if you consider that the... Uh, that the uh, 
the uh, moon has one sixth the gravity of the planet Earth. All right, and the impact was at a low angle, you know. So that's kind of how this works, see. Um, and incidentally, I just got to tell you, you know, you see how some of the craters, see it says Messier E, Messier D. You, people tend to think that these are all related to each other. Um, it's probably true in the case of Messier and Messier A, okay? But there's no reason to think that Messier B and uh, the rest of these Messier named craters all happened at the same time. These are called satellite craters, and they're named this way not because they happened at the same time. That's, it's tempting to think that. Uh, they're named that way because they seem to be, um, they just seem to be near each other. So they're, they're craters that are near each other. Okay. Now, the other thing about uh, Messier uh, is that they, the craters, these craters tend to look elliptical as well. But then again, so do these craters. And it seems like they get more and more elliptical near the edge. Of course, that's because we're looking at them as they go around the edge of the moon, see? All right. So you might say, well, how will we ever know if we're looking at an elliptical crater or a round crater? I'm glad you asked. Because up here, uh, you have in a, in where it says switch projections, and I showed you those projections. The one thing I did not mention is the lunar 3D globe. Let's do that. Oh, what's this? Well, now, you see, we have something different. This is a 3D globe of the moon that you can spin around now. Isn't that cool? You can come down here, and again, you have nearly the same resolution uh, as the others, okay, as the other uh, uh, movement uh, within the LRO Quick Map Browser. However, now you can see that this crater is round. It did kind of look elliptical before. This crater is round. It looked elliptical before, but it's not. See, this is now the better data coming in. As you get closer, the better passes of data from the satellite come down and show you uh, themselves, and I think that's pretty neat. So uh, this is a simple crater because it doesn't have any complex central peak. The difference between a, 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 a complex and a simple crater is that a simple crater is made usually from one uh, very uh, moderate but not massive impact, okay? A major, uh, you know, a complex crater is, is, a, is one that actually occurs when you have more energy of impact, Some, something like this, where you actually see, uh, and this one's a very good one to show. This is probably the best one, actually, because you actually have a simple crater here and a complex crater here. The complex crater is marked by uh, some, some really interesting features. Uh, there's a central peak. And sometimes you have terraced walls in the crater, which we see something like that. And there's also rills. Uh, these are uh, probably um, areas where magma cooled uh, and eventually the ground subsided. Uh, there could be lava tubes as well under the surface, but probably a series of massive cracks from this particular impact, fractured the lunar surface, magma came out, flowed across the surface, some filled this in. As you can see, it looks like, uh, you know, a little, like, like quote-unquote, water filled this in. Well, that's the actual, um, you know, that's the uh, leveling, the auto-leveling done by magma, which, of course, when it, when it uh, cools, it becomes, you know, rock again. And then sometime later, uh, this crater occurred, and it plowed into this edge of this crater, uh, this other crater, and uh, made a simple crater uh, imprint that's superimposed on the earlier crater. Okay. Then later on, after this crater was made, these little impacts occurred, and all these other little impacts in here occurred. All right. So remember, this by looking at these, you can tell the chronology of impacts and when they happened. You know, when you look at a crater, you can go through this and tell exactly uh, when one hit, when another hit, and so forth. You can actually build the entire chronology uh, of this. But let's do something here. Let's go to our little tool, and let's do a line through here. What do you say? We're going to uh, 
actually want to do it. Uh, all right, I'll do it this way. So I'm going to go through part of the uh, symbol creator, but I am going to include the central peak here. So now we're going to get this right here. And over here on the left, you can actually see, okay, here's the simple crater. And again, it's got vertical exaggeration, right? And that means that uh, because it's smaller than this crater, the scale is made to hold, you know, this crater from here to here. Um, so you see a vertical exaggeration there. Uh, you wouldn't see it that steep. This is that small crater. How do you know? Because you can, uh, you can actually see the... Uh, you're supposed to see the line. I'm not seeing it. Where's the line? Uh, this is a little bug we found in this. Uh, I'm going to do it this way. Let's go look at detailed for a minute. Sorry. Is it fair to say that the small crater is indeed deeper than the big crater? This is, yeah, this is actually true. You can see from here. It's giving us that data right there. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. Uh, minus 3,082 meters below mean uh, lunar level. And that's to this point, actually. It's actually deeper than that. All right, I'm going to do this again because I want my I want my lines to... Uh, oh, you know what? In this, We're in the 3D globe, aren't we? I think we're in the 3D globe still. Yeah, in the 3D globe, uh, not all the, the features are available. Uh, so we're not getting our line across here because of that. But I'll check that right now. Let's go from the central peak over across here. All right. Now we got that. So, yeah, because we're in the 3D globe and the way the 3D globe is drawn on the map, uh, we're not actually getting um, we're not getting the, uh, the line showing us exactly where we are. Okay. Now, uh, you'll notice now the crater appears at this end. That's because I drew from this end to there. So the start to finish line is very important. Uh, it tells you where uh, you're going to start to see uh, features. Okay, so now, uh, and it's weird because it's kind of opposite. So here, the bottom here is at minus 3,374 meters below mean lunar, lunar uh, radius. That's where the bottom of this crater is. You'll notice, though, that the bottom of the other crater is far higher. You know, before the central peak is where it's about its deepest. Uh, and we're talking about minus 2,600 meters below mean lunar radius. So, again, not all craters are the same depth, nor are they the same across the bottom. Uh, if we do a smaller view through this crater, just this guy, okay, now you'll see this looks very different. See, when our scale is extended to be just uh, this small crater, well then, you see the slope doesn't look like it's as steep as it was. That's because we're not compressing the entire uh, uh, width of this crater into a, a, a test location, a test distance that's this big. Okay, so it's actually scaling it for this width that we have, right? And we went 2.744 kilometers here. That's actually that's actually like a 2.3 kilometer diameter crater. Isn't that crazy? That's amazing. So anyway. This, this is uh, a really neat product to, to actually examine this, uh, the moon. I'm going to show you something else too right now, which I think is really cool. Again, we are in the 3D view. How do we know? Well, look. We can go really cool here now. Oh, I, I told you something earlier uh, that I was going to show you, Daryl. This is the Aiken Basin down here. This is the far side of the moon. And this is the Aiken Basin. You can see it's a little darker. Um, but this is Aiken right here, uh, and let's, it's actually the lowest point in the moon is here, so let's draw an arc through this, uh, right here, and see if we catch it. Yeah, see, now look at the, the this is minus 5,400 meters below the lunar mean radius, isn't that crazy? Oh. Yeah, yeah, and we're talking about an area that's actually right around here. All right, um, and to see that for sure, I'll show you. Uh, if we get out of this for now, and go back to uh, not a, let's see, we're on the lunar 3D globe. Let's go orthographic far side. Okay. Okay. So now, if we come down here, all right, uh, let's go. 
So that's Korolev. So let's go down here. Let me let me do this again, and we'll see our our. Uh, I'll see our. We'll see our our uh, values. Right there. See minus five thousand five hundred thirty-seven meters below mean lunar uh, radius. That's that's deep. And that's the lowest spot on the moon. The highest spot on the moon, okay, is actually somewhat north. And it's really small. It's a tiny little spot. Uh, and I'm going to try it, it. It's near a crater that begins with N. And I can't remember the name. Korolev was, uh, was a uh, kind of an indicator for me. Not that you could spend a whole lot of time looking at the moon here, right? Because uh, we never see this side. And I know you don't remember it, Daryl. Amanda, do you know where it is? Do I know where what is? The highest spot on the moon. Um, uh, Olympus sorry, Mons? I was muted. That's okay. Might is be it here. Olympus Mars? Olympus Mars? Oh. No. on the, on. Mars. That's Mars. Yeah, but I see, don't remember, Mark. Peak on the moon? yeah, I think I got it. It's like I think it's right here, six thousand six hundred and six thousand five hundred seventy-one meters above the lunar mean radius, uh, and I remember that it's right somewhere in here. And this is it's sort of near this Engelhart crater. And I got to tell you something. Um, the reason that's as high as it is has to do with the fact that this is as low as it, low as it is down here why because when the impact occurred that caused this basin to be gouged out and then of course subsequently filled with lava and other impactors it sent shock waves through the moon and among them uh it, it sent one particular set of waves and actually plowed lots of material ahead of it as it went and it actually made one section here somewhere around Engelhart here actually raise up very high it's the highest spot on the moon and I think it's actually right here I think I'm off a little not that it matters but let me just, just go ahead and see let's go see if it's like here all right so is that it right there no the other spot was higher so I guess it was right more like I said but this is this is one of the highest spots on the moon right here all right, and it's all on the far side, lowest and highest, far side. But notice, this is the far side. We've never seen this before, uh, you know, until until uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. All right, and now of course That's China, fair. yeah, China landed on the far side now, um, and it's really interesting. And and but I want you to notice something about the far side of the moon. I'm going to get rid of these and just pull out a little bit. We'll leave the nomenclature on for now. Um, but you can turn it off, you know, if you need to, you know, if you want to, you can always turn it off. And and how is it? It's under overlays up here. All right. And then nomenclature. See? Bink. It all goes away. If you want to see the names, well, then you put it, turn it on. Okay. So let's do this. Let's let's just take a look at the moon here, the far side for a second. Only a couple and spots. Can yep. we take a question while we're doing that? Absolutely. Marco wants to know. Is there any water on the surface of the moon? Marco, I am sorry. You asked that question a long time ago, I think twice. And I was not ignoring you. I apologize uh, profusely. I did not. These questions are going back. I know. I like no, when you I, get carried away by it. I know. And, and it, but it has, it has its negative points, and this is one of them. So, Marco, I'm sorry about that. Um, yes, in fact, there is water on the moon, but not in the way you expect to see it. The lunar soil... Uh, has water bound up in it. And in some of the craters that we talked about earlier, okay, like for instance, the orthographic south pole, if we're looking at the, at the south pole of the moon, some of these craters never see the light of day, right, ever. Um, and as far as, um, as far as what craters there are that never see the light of day, you can come into layers here, scroll down a bit, and look around and you see, hey, look, permanently shadowed regions. That is where, wa where, where uh, light never reaches. And so we hit that and we see all the craters around the South Pole. 
where light never penetrates. Okay. And it was in there that we thought, hey, maybe there's going to be some type of water in here because this is a permanently shadowed region. Maybe there's ice, you know. And let's turn back on our nomenclature uh, for now because I'd like to actually show you something. All right, so let's do this and get rid of it. Okay, so now uh, when the LCROSS mission, L-C-R-O-S-S, -S, uh, came around uh, or when they used it, uh, the, the L-Cross mission was used to actually determine whether there was any water on, on the south pole of the moon. And they figured it, if you look inside one of these craters, that'd be the best place to look. So they, as I said earlier tonight, they launched a, uh, from a spacecraft that was orbiting the moon, they launched a booster off the spacecraft that helped get it to the moon. And they crashed it into Cabeus Crater, which is right here. Okay. When they crashed it into Cabeus Crater, they examined the dust that flew up. And this dust uh, plume, the spectrum of this dust plume showed indeed that there was ice in that plume. So they confirmed that there was ice and so forth in, the, in the, that location. And this is why for, the, for a while we were saying, well, to make a lunar base, humans need water. So we would have to make the water on site. So how would we do it? Well, if there's ice around, it's easy. And it turns out that there's ice in Cabeus and some of these other craters uh, that are currently, um, you know, in permanent shadow. All right. However, uh, later research showed that even out here, okay, even out in like Haosan and, and Bailey and these other locations, other places that aren't in permanent shadow, there is also enough water in that lunar soil that we would be able to make water at the moon as well. So uh, it turns out that we didn't actually need to uh, think about building a, a, a colony or a base near the South Pole. We can build it anywhere. You know, it will be a little harder to find or to get the water uh, elsewhere. But you know what? Uh, we'll still be able to get it. And that's the cool part. So uh, that's neat. Uh, so this, so there's there's water on the moon, just not in the form that we can use right away. We'd have to extract it. Um, but uh, okay, Amanda, is there more? Yes, there is. He had another question, Marco did. Okay. Um, are there any colors on the moon? He's heard that it's not just all gray. Oh, it's absolutely not. What a great question. And let me see. It is a great question. Let me uh, see if, uh, let me see if we can show that here. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you. I have not yet seen, I'm going to turn off nomenclature. I've not yet seen um, here a way to show that, um, but I am looking. I will May I say, uh, yes. there was an image on Reddit <laughs> recently of some guy who processed a ton of lunar images, and he punched the colors up way too much, but it vividly showed all the colors, you know, of all the different substances on the moon. Yes. Uh, I've seen it well done with other images where it's subtle, but you can still see the difference in color yep. on different areas of the moon. Yeah, absolutely right. And uh, even within SkyTour Livestream, for instance, if you look here, okay, in this basin right here, you can see this is a darker material than this. Well, uh, I think that we're looking at a black and white image here uh, because the black and white images are the uh, higher resolution. Um, and we can see that you can see the difference here. Okay, but we're not able to see the colors uh, with it at the moment. And I'm, I'm trying to see if there was a, uh, if there was a uh, color. Yeah, me. Yeah, and it's not diviner. It could be prospector because it was looking for uh, a few things. Like this is not the colors. This is actually just showing where there's thorium on the moon, which is fascinating. I mean, 
you can take this and look at and, and use it for some uh, really good uh, you know science approximations for your stuff you know if you ever want to do that you know and you can see there's not it's not the highest resolution to, to, to find that data out but uh, or, or it's not the data that's in the highest resolution but it still works so that's lunar prospector um, yeah not grail uh, Chandrayaan how's that do that this is reflectance and that actually helps that that gives some kind of uh, that does give us uh, a view um, so if we turn that on um, I'm just trying to see if that you yeah, don't see it there we go okay so it was a smaller this isn't what you're looking for but I'm trying to show you that uh, there are mineralogical studies that are based on uh, spectra that have been taken of these different areas okay so strips like this uh, let's see uh, Clementine no no uh, geologic maps I don't think so I think I looked at this earlier you go here yeah those are those are just geologic maps that show us uh, where different uh, minerals and so forth are on the moon but you can see, you can see here, all right, that, uh, and this was done from 2000, this was 2013 when this was actually done. Um, but this sort of gives uh, you know, some mineral concentrations and you have to look at the key to figure out uh, what's going on here. That's actually really cool that they do that. Oh yeah. We just have to look at the key, you know, I don't think that uh, it's not a dynamic key, so we'd have to get the key elsewhere. You know what I mean? So, yeah, so that one, it is very cool, and I just wish that uh, we had, um, wish we had the key uh, just to go through all this. Um, Again. If you just do a, a Google image search on color or moon, oh, yeah. uh, colors on the moon or something of the sort, all sorts of stuff comes up. Sure. I actually did that with Skytour Livestream. We took uh, you know, photos, and then I actually took a video of the moon in 4K, and then I took each frame of the video and stacked it You know, so that I had basically 5,000 photos that I was stacking of the moon from each image, you know, from each, uh, um, you, know, you know, within a second you had, you know, 30 frames per second, you know. Um, uh -huh. So, you know, 10 seconds. Oh, I remember you doing Yeah. That. You know, 30 frames per second, 10 seconds is 300 frames. And if you do a, you know, a one minute, you know, shot there, you've got almost 2,000 frames to play with, you know, and, and so it's kind of fun. Uh, you have to throw some away, too. I want to say the guy on Reddit claimed he stacked like a hundred and fifty thousand images or something to uh, pull up those colors like he did. Yeah. But again, it looked like he, he punched the colors up a ton in Photoshop or something. Yeah, he increased the saturation, but it's okay because you know, and one hundred fifty thousand images is not not hard to do, uh, especially when you're taking high res video because each frame of your video is is going to be uh you know a photo basically uh, and if you do 60 frames per second or even 120 frames per second in the video well then you have 120 frames per second well you know it only takes a thousand seconds to get 120,000 frames you know so you know, that that's that's uh he didn't take pictures with a camera you know what i mean he actually I'm sorry, he took pictures with a video camera, not a still camera. 
I understand. Yeah. yeah. But in any case, I, I don't think we can actually, uh, I don't think we actually can do the, uh, uh, the colors with this. I think it's black and white data. Uh, frankly, I mean, unfortunately, but, um, and when you look at the moon, one of the most uh, amazing locations to, to look at is right here, okay? This is Mons Pico, and you can see the name. Mons Pico is a mountain that's just right out there. Uh, it's just south of Plato, okay? And it has, it's right next to this really interesting set of pits that you see. And you might be, you know tempted to think, wow, like a string of meteorites or something hit the moon there. Um, but in fact, those uh, may be from volcanic origin, and they might be collapsed pits from, uh, you know, collapsed lava pits, you know, from a collapsed lava tube under the surface. Uh, and they, they do that. They do collapse in a string like that and look really odd um, at times. But Mons Pico is a really interesting little mountain. And you might say, well, tell me more. And that's easy because with our tool, you go over to the draw and the search tool, okay, and you grab the arc, and then you just say, well, let's start here. No, start here. Start from the upper left, cross over, and go to the lower right. And now we'll see Mons Pico. So uh, over here, it's uh, minus 2,894 uh, meters. Uh, below mean lunar radius and it climbs to a height of minus 444 meters uh, below the lunar mean radius so even this mountain is below the lunar mean radius huh. it, yeah isn't that cool and then you come back out to minus 2700 this, this is the whole point okay is this entire region is actually uh, uh, very low and you might say well, how come it's so low you know well the look of the near side kind of gives you a hint at that okay again I'm gonna take off nomenclature now uh, and then by the way in case you're getting lost with what I'm clicking I am gonna go over all this again very carefully so that you won't uh, uh, lose it and it'll give you time to digest here's the near side of the moon all right and let's compare it again to the far side of the moon. Okay, here's the far side of the moon. And again, when we look at the far side of the moon, we notice there's only two places, basically, where we see Maria, that is to say, the lunar seas. One is over here, Mare Moscoviense, okay, and then one's down here, the crater Tsiolkovsky, which is right there, okay? Tsiolkovsky looks nicely flat in there, but if we zoom in on it, you'll notice it's actually not. Okay, it's the same as before. It's got this, uh, it's, it's peppered with all these craters within craters. Look at this. You know, one crater has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like countless little tiny craterlets within a, a, a craterlet. So uh, Tsiolkovsky, uh, flat as it looks, uh, isn't. And that's all craters that occurred after the basin of this complex crater was flooded. See, if you can subtract out this dark gray and just imagine what the basin looked like the head or before that, uh, that was just before the lava began to fill it in. And then as the, as the magma, I'm sorry, uh, oozed out of the uh, moon and then flowed as lava over the surface, it found its own level, uh, you know, based on the gravity of the moon, and it just settled into this heart-shaped uh, little basin, okay? And so Tsiolkovsky has this dark gray area, all right? Miramoskoviense is the only other one on the dark side of the moon, on the far side of the moon, I mean. Um, there's a couple of minor ones down here, but these, these are actually very different, okay? They're not, uh, they're not, uh, uh, let me look, I don't want to look at that yet. Um, they're not actually areas where um, we have full seas, okay? And the reason, it's generally a little darker down here, but that's the Aiken Basin. That's the lowest spot on the moon. Yet on the other side of the moon, okay, the near side, we have all these seas 
in these dark areas. Now, immediately, when I, when I was actually a kid, we didn't have but just a few pictures of the far side. Uh, but it was enough to notice that there were no Maria on the far side. I always wondered why. Always wondered why. Well, I didn't learn a potential answer until just a few years ago. And I've been very interested in this ever since. It turns out that in the early formation of the Earth and the Moon, uh, when the Moon was perhaps blown off of the Earth, blown out of the Earth by a Mars-sized impactor, uh, and the Moon began to coalesce and form a spherical body again, you know, from all the debris floating around the Earth, and the Earth began to cool as well. Um, there was a point where... Uh, yeah, Mal, I said dark side, sorry. Um, there's a point where uh, the moon had cooled enough so that uh, the, the crust had solidified. Same as the Earth, but the Earth was much bigger and had a very large infrared energy output. That is heat output. Infrared is heat, right? And that heat output radiated to the moon. Well, in the same way, okay, we know that the sun has radiation pressure, okay, that exerts, uh, uh, it exerts on, on everything based on uh, the, the speed of these, these, these photons that come from the sun, the speed of the radiation, so to speak. Well, that also happened with the Earth and the moon system in that the Earth's infrared energy, when it was just cooling, all right, was massive. And it was radiating toward the moon. So the theory is that as impactors struck this side of the moon, okay, say, bam, you know, Copernicus, pow, this thing over here, boom, this whole basin. As that happened, what happened was it would shoot debris up into the area around the moon. We can't say air around the moon. We have to say exosphere as opposed to atmosphere. Around the, in the exosphere of the moon, as debris went up, and the radiation pressure from that infrared radiation, it's theorized, blew and pushed that debris uh, over to this far side. And wow. that meant that over that, that, and again, that means that the, that this is, that's important. Because that means, <laughs> Raymond, thank you. That means that the radiation that pushed that stuff over to the far side that stuff settled on the far side where it then became part of the structure of this of the moon over here all right that's amazing and that just amazing and that yeah and that meant that this crust on this side of the moon was thicker over the time it also meant that the crust on the far side of the moon uh, was denser than the near side crust and that meant that the moon was oblong and not in not the, the the center of mass was not in the middle the center of the moon okay that is very fascinating to me and now the other thing is it tells us something else too is because we don't see any of those maria here and we see all these craters it shows us that the tidal locking that is where the near side of the moon and the far side of the moon were in uh, were were locked like they are today, where the where the far side always facing away from us. The near and the far side of the moon had already been tidally locked by the time this occurred. You see, and that's how we learn chronology, folks. This is how we learn when things happen, because by st by studying the ages of some of these craters and so forth, we know kind of when the moon was tidally locked. It was tidally locked before, before this debris was sent hurtling over the limb of the moon by the infrared radiation pressure from the Earth, if that theory is correct. Wow. But, but think about it. How else do we explain the difference in the thickness of the crust? This side of the moon, so much thinner than the other side of the moon. I think that's just an amazing finding. And the theory is, I think, is sound. I, I kind of like that theory um, because being that the Earth was bigger and more massive, it had more thermal mass. It could hold on to heat a lot longer. So it would have stayed hot for a lot longer than a small moon. 
So the moon would cool and, and, and end up cooling into a, an object that was fairly hard. But of course, it was molten inside at the time. And the earth, it was very molten inside. But the earth stayed warm for a lot longer. And this could be the reason why we see this huge difference in the near and the far side. Isn't that cool? It is. Yeah, this is a really, really cool finding. If, uh, would if it's that true. say, if you could go back and look at the near side again, where you can see all the Lunar Maria, uh, Maria, that uh, uh, if the impact happened on a side facing the Earth, that the objects that struck the moon must have been coming from our general direction, heading toward the moon. See what I'm saying? Like absolutely. It, it like came here. from behind us and just missed us and hit the moon instead. Yeah. Ted, thank you. My gosh, that's, that's so wonderful. Thank you. I was just about to say thank you, Ted. I, the I'm, generosity from Chad is overwhelming. You know, you guys, I I know you, <laughs> I know Raymond, you said no comment, and I'm sorry, okay? I, I apologize. I just can't, I can't say nothing. I can't just sit here and say nothing. Um, you know, uh, you guys We're make this all worth like it. There's no tomorrow after the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm gonna shut up now. Oh no, that's that's. No. I I will be I will be happy for the entire weekend based on what I see here in my chat. I love these people. You guys are great. You know, you make it worth doing. Uh, you really do. Uh, and uh, and that people are so willing to do it for a science based show. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's incredible. Yeah, that's actually very. That's key. That's key. You know. Uh, and I appreciate that. I mean, we have 58 people watching right now. Welcome to all of you. I know there's there's a number of you here that have never been here before. Uh, please do welcome feel to free. The family. Yeah, we welcome. You know, please do feel free to to um, uh, throw out some comments in the chat. That way, I'll know you're here, and I'll be able to talk to you. Like, I know that Tan is here. Uh, and I know Christopher Rupert's here. I know Dagger Spells here. David Schmidt, welcome, my friend. I know you're here, Amanda. Do W's here. Marco's here with fantastic questions. Raymond B is here with wonderful uh, support. Uh, Ted Bronson's here with wonderful support. And uh, you know, there's a lot more of you out there. Uh, but I and I appreciate that. And I'm not saying you have to say something, but if you want a shout out, I'd love to know you're there. So send me send a comment in the chat, and uh, Amanda and I and, and even Daryl will. Uh, We'll do it. We'll check it out. Raymond, thank you again. Wow. Yeah. You know, these guys, you, <laughs> I, do not, uh, I do not know what to say about these folks. I don't know what to say. Um, so is there anything in chat I need to uh, pay attention to now? Is there more questions? Yes, we have some questions. Okay, go for it. Okay, one, I hope he's still in the room. This uh, is from a while back. Uh, MTX303 wanted to know... Can we see the moon rovers? Uh, you know, you kind of, sort of. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that. I'm going to go back to, and over on the left side again, remember, um, we have the, the projections, again, which are far side, near side, and then the uh, poles, and then, of course, the lunar 3D globe. Um, and then in our layers, this is the complex part. You have to... You kind of have to read through this and, and, and see what they're all showing you. There's a tremendous number of, of experimental uh, rovers and other, and other data and orbiters that have been sent to the moon. Uh, but some of them you see, okay, and I, I preset this, uh, are, are actually areas where we saw um, the Apollos land, and the Apollos had rovers. Now, they didn't have a rover until, was it Apollo 15, wasn't it? Was the first time they actually had a rover? Um, Daryl's on mute because I don't know the answer. That's okay. That's fine. But you see, here is where Apollo 15 landed, all right? Uh, and if we come down here, and if we want to look, actually, if we just go into uh, nomenclature again, just leave the nomenclature on so we can actually see this, and then we can do that. Okay. So they are by Archimedes Crater, and... In here, in this little tiny backwater location, so to speak, okay, this is Hadley Rill, which is a collapsed lava tube. Uh, and then 
up here in this little harbor, so to speak, we actually have a bunch of other data here, and that's because uh, we had uh, uh, some close-ups done here a long time ago before we actually landed with Apollo. And if we look really close now, we can see um, the tracks that were left by the rover here and the astronauts walking. Okay, and I'm just going to, uh, so we zoomed in now. I have to do just one thing here. Let me do this. Okay, I can actually, uh, I can change. I want to change. All right, here's what I'm going to change. I'm going to change the uh, opacity of the letters. While you're doing words. that, did you see a video Tana shared with you? Did you get to watch that yet? Oh, I think I did. There was not. Uh, I think she shared that with me the other day. Something with new objects shown. Yeah, that, that was the other day. I think Tana, right? Do you have any thoughts on that? While we're looking for the rovers. Yeah, I have to. I have to go remember what it was. I I, I looked at with hers. Oh, okay. No, I will. No, I will. Sorry. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> okay, so here. Okay. Oops. I'm gonna do this. Let me just drop this down. Sorry. Oh, so if I reduce the opacity to nothing, now we can actually see. This is right here, what you're seeing right there, that is the lunar module, the, the descent module on the moon. And you can see that the focus of the uh, lunar landing here, this was for Apollo 15, it was here. And this was the distance they went out here. I'm not sure if the rover was left out here, or, if, or I think 15 had a rover. Daryl, do you know, do you remember? Dr. Mark is saying Apollo 15, 16, and 17 had rovers. Yeah, I, th uh, I think he's right. That sounds right to me. Yeah, and I think the Apollo 15's rover was left out here. And I think we're seeing the shadow of it right there. So so when I say yes and no, but we have to be careful, we can see the shadows of the rovers. Uh, but there's other, there's, other, um, there's other indicators that show us that we might also be able to see uh, something else, and I just want to, okay, so here we are, and, uh, I'm wondering if we can see this, let's just, let's go take a look at this, oh yeah, see, okay, there we are, Lunar Rover 1, right there, so you can see now, this is, this is, uh, the Falcon, the scent stage we just looked at, and then we saw that trail, and this is where the Lunar Rover was left, and we see its shadow and a little tiny reflection off the rover. This was taken from 30 miles up. Okay, so not a bad, not bad for a small camera on a uh, uh, on a satellite that's orbiting. Yep. So yeah, so this is the landing site, uh, and that's kind of really cool. Um, and this. Uh, the retro reflector, it's, it's called the, uh, the, the Lunar Laser Ranging Retro Reflector, the LRRR. That's over here. What is that? Well, that was uh, left by Apollo 15. There was one left by Apollo 11. I think they all left them, I think. Um, and the LRRR was a, an experiment so that you could actually aim a laser at the moon and get a signal back. All right. And that signal would come back to you with a certain amount of a time delay. And the time delay at the speed of light is a, a value that can tell you exactly how far the moon is from you at that moment. Um, and uh, that was interesting. And Charles, I'll answer that question in a minute. Um, the, so the LRRR, the Lunar uh, Laser Ranging and Reconnaissance, I'm sorry, Retro Reflector Array, uh, Ranging Retro Reflector, um, that was made with a bunch of these little reflectors in a panel. And those those reflectors were called corner reflectors. That is to say, the same kind of thing that's in the taillights of cars. So that wherever you are, at whatever angle to the light you are, if you aim a flashlight at it, you'll get a reflection back from it. Okay? And that is how, um, that's how these uh, reflectors work. Now, I know about these reflectors because I've seen them close up, the real ones. Uh, and it's because uh, in, when I got my degree, the university where I got my astronomy degree was the university that actually built them. 
And so uh, the lunar, recon- lunar laser ranging and retroflector uh, uh, array, I call it the LRRR, uh, we have uh, several uh, full size ones. And they're only about the size of, they're only about like three feet by three feet across. Uh, and pretty heavy, but you know, in one sixth gravity, you know, you carry them like you're carrying a, you know, a, a towel. It's actually they're pretty light at that, at that, uh, in that case. So the bottom line is that um, this, when you aim laser light at the moon, okay, uh, the beam is going to diverge quite far, so that by the time it gets to the moon, it's very, very wide, okay, and you're only going to get a small fraction of the light back. So if we only had one L triple R uh, array on the moon, we might not be able to see it, but we have several. And it doesn't matter that they're all over the place because it's uh, almost the same exact uh, location in a sense. Uh, the curvature of the moon puts them in little different areas, but uh, there's a way to actually use that to our advantage. And we could tell uh, all of the minutest movements that the moon makes in its orbit based on the way those reflections look and the way the timings come back. And the timings are the important thing. Uh, very, very interesting. And I, I really liked, uh, I really like this. So, so that's, uh, that's where the, uh, lunar, uh, and in fact, from, from here, uh, the lunar, uh, retro reflector array is out here. Okay. And the rover is here. Okay. So yes, yeah, so there's, that's that. And that's, that's Apollo 15. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Charles, you mentioned earlier, Apollo 17 actually uh, was able to use the camera on the lunar rover to aim up as the uh, lunar module ascent stage was leaving the moon. Um, can you imagine if you were an astronaut and going, wait, 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 <laughs> wait for me. Oh, man. Well, anyway, <clears throat> the... Uh, the Apollo 17 uh, stage was, uh, the uh, lunar rover was used to actually, uh, uh, you know, video the rover leaving. I'm sorry, video the, uh, uh, the video it leaving. And so, um, I'm not sure where the rover was, but I'm sure that if we look here, we'll see it. If Maybe, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, this is just a close-up. Okay, you see the Apollo 17 descent module here. And here you're seeing actually the shadow of the flag. So even with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, you can actually see uh, the flag. Okay? And this is what was left of the Apollo 17 uh, descent stage after uh, the ascent stage lifted off. And that ended our, our visit to the moon, actually. Here's what I wanted to see. Okay, so here is the here's Challenger, the descent stage. Okay, um, here is the final parking spot for the rover, and it was aiming at the lunar module, and then it followed it up. It moved its camera up. Now, they tried to do this with previous uh, uh, ascents from the moon, uh, like for the 16 and so forth, but unfortunately, the camera either went too fast or too slow, uh, but they got it right with Apollo 17 which is kind of cool. I mean, he almost got it right. It wasn't perfect, uh, but it was pretty good. And again, you see the paths of the rover here. Uh, you see the flag, that little tiny dot right there. That's actually the flag. Uh, and I wonder if we can uh, zoom in on this. I think we can. Uh, let me... Uh, I got... Yeah, no, we're not going to be able to zoom in any really any more than we see it there. I was just trying to see if we could. I had it on a different screen. Uh, but bottom line is this is uh, this is where we were uh, for the final time on the moon. Okay. Now, the other thing is you'll notice that around the flag, you see this sort of darker area. Well, that's because the astronauts had been walking around and tooling around in there a little bit around the base of the lunar module. You see this darker area. Well, that's the scour. That's the area that the jet, uh, the, the, the engine, the thrust, uh, was shooting down below uh, and scoured a, a little round, um, uh, and not even a hole, but just scoured the, the, the lighter dust off the surface of the moon, leaving this darker area behind. Um, so, 
And Charles, I think you're right. Charles asking another question. I, I thought they made. Uh, I thought they. I think made. Uh, they two made video. I'm not sure what you mean there, Charles. One more successful than the other. Yes, I'm sure that's true. Actually, I wasn't sure which, but this is the first time I realized they need to be shooting it from the rover. Yeah. Otherwise, we've left someone on the moon. Uh, but you're right. Um, really cool. Uh, and Dave Schmidt says, Did any of the later, later findings take back any samples of the soil uh, from the scoured area? Uh, no, they actually... <laughs> it's kind of interesting. They they actually never really sampled the scour areas um, because that was uh, going to be uh, contaminated with uh, material from the engine thrust. Uh, they went to far sites like, you know, Geophone Rock out here to get samples in other locations. That's why they went so far away um, to get far enough away from the from the landing site so as to get pure, unadulterated, uncontaminated uh, sample material. Um, after all, if we're going to bring back a few pounds of rocks from the moon overall, uh, it's one of those things where we got to spend a lot of time to get far enough away to really make sure that we don't, uh, we don't, uh, you know, pollute the, uh, or, or get polluted stuff back, you know, when we go. So the Apollo 17 was sort of like the last site we went to and we back away and it's like, goodbye, Apollo 17, goodbye moon. Cause we never went back. Could we? Absolutely. We could, uh, you know, and, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, going over to Apollo 12, Apollo 12's landing site, and I actually had dinner with one of the Apollo 12 astronauts, um, Alan Bean. And uh, Captain Bean and I uh, hit it off when uh, he was speaking at a science uh, gathering where I actually uh, was working at the time. And uh, we started talking, and next thing you know, he's saying, why don't you come to dinner with us? And the director of the science facility said, oh, well, no, no, I was actually going to go with you, Captain Bean. And, you know, the, the, the guy's my boss. And Alan Bean said, no, I, I, want, I want Mark to come too. <laughs> so I kind of like felt like a little, oh, boy, that's uncomfortable. Um, but he relented, and I ended up going. We had a great time at dinner. Uh, I didn't dominate. I let Captain Bean and the director talk a lot, and I sat there. But he kept, you know, including me in the conversation, really hugely nice man. Uh, and then I actually have one of his original paintings, actually. He's an artist, and I got a beautiful painting that he did. Um, and it's just beautiful. It's a man on the moon. He, he, when he painted it, what's interesting is I, he painted a scene on the moon from his uh, mission. I also painted a scene on the moon from his mission years earlier. Um, and I put down, uh, and I showed it to him. I brought it with me to this science thing and said, hey, look, look what I did. I did the same one. It was almost an identical photo to the painting he did. Very cool. And he looks at it, and he puts his hand on his chin, and he goes, can I, be a, can I give a criticism? I said, yes, of course. He goes, more color. He says, there was more color up there. And I went, oh, I never knew that. We don't get to see that. He goes, I know. The, the moon actually had color. You know, we saw white rocks, we saw orange soil, uh, brown soil, and of course the gray soil and all that, but there was more colors up there than I ever thought possible. And that's the thing that I thought was amazing, you know, that there were more colors up there, you know. So this is Apollo 12 here, and, you know, I, and, and Laura, I see Laura Hubby's here. Hey, Laura, how are you? This is Apollo 12, and what's neat is, okay, if you look, you can see the path all the way around this crater that they went on. This is not a dome, it's a crater. But then there's something right here. You see that? A little thing with a shadow? Well, I wonder what that is. And I think we can figure it out if we can, we can get to this. I'll show you. Okay, it's actually a probe that had landed there uh, several years earlier, <clears throat> called Surveyor 3. So... Intrepid lands in this one location and it lands on the other side of this crater and the astronauts walk over and go downhill to see the surveyor. Uh, it was an odd time or an odd place to... to, to here's the, a view of them obviously stepping out. Um, and for anyone who says, well, look, I don't see stars. Was this a movie set? Now, the answer, of course, is that to get the moon to look anything normal, in other words, some level of gray... Uh, you have to realize that it had to vastly underexpose 
the moon so that it would be gray and thus that means any of the stars would be completely lost in the imagery okay so now uh, clearly that's what's happening here you can see that they had they actually landed at a, a low sun elevation and then look this is the shot I want to show you check this out this is where they actually went all the way to the surveyor okay and they actually went uh, and touched the surveyor and we're playing with the surveyor there uphill is the intrepid sitting there that's the antenna to the earth the intrepid is sitting here they walked all the way around came down here into the crater uh, and we're checking this out isn't that cool I think that's neat that's uh, cool. yeah and that's something that landed there several years earlier and gave us images of the moon and kind of the reason we actually went here because we thought well hey this is an area of the moon that we kind of know from direct view so this is neat and and this mission was actually one of my favorites because of the fact not just because you know Alan Bean was on it but just because of the fact that uh, they actually saw something else we left earlier it was almost like almost like one of those uh, crossover things in science fiction where you know Kirk meets Picard or something like that in Star Trek you know here it's uh, surveyor meets uh, you know the modern astronaut at the time which by today's standard is hugely primitive I think you guys may have known but you know when they walked on the moon uh, the soils on the moon were, 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 were like fine glass as well as dust and particles because whenever you had an impactor that vaporized parts of the soil these, these this fine debris would be thrown off that's molten and when it cooled it would cool like glass and it was very very sharp and the astronauts had spacesuits that were fabric they had inner uh, layers that were uh, fabric and cooling garments within well and of course insulation well um, one of the astronauts I think it was Schmidt I'm not sure um, he did two moonwalks and couldn't do a third because of the fact that the abrasive lunar dust had almost cut off uh, and cut through the outer fabric layer of his spacesuit so his ankle location on one of his uh, legs was almost cut through and had it cut through uh, he would not have survived so they felt it was imperative that he not do another spacewalk or, or moonwalk. Uh, so think about that. that. That tells you how abrasive the lunar soil is. And that's what happens in a vacuum uh, with many, many impacts like you see that happen here. All right. This is very, very cool. Now, so we've seen Apollo 15, Apollo 17, Apollo 12. Uh, how about? Question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm being quiet. Are, are you done or are you, are you moving uh, on to something totally I, different? I, if, if in the absence of you talking, I will be moving on. But you go right ahead and tell me what you want to say. Okay. We have two more questions so far. Okay. So let's cool. not get too far behind. Do, uh, do W. Yes. Wants to know what causes a blood moon? Oh, well, that's a great question because we just saw one uh, recently. Exactly. Um now, uh, what causes a, a blood moon, and the reason it's called a blood moon is because it's red, is something that you see every day. It's the Earth's atmosphere. They say, wait, wait a minute, that's the moon. Well, how come it's blood moon? Why, why is it red? Well, because the light striking the moon is light that's going through our atmosphere and striking the moon. How can that be? Now, light, not the atmosphere itself. Okay, the light going through. Well, uh, that's because the moon is actually passing into the shadow of the Earth. Now, it happens uh, rarely, but when it does happen, we actually see um, we actually see uh, from the moon we would see a red sunset basically as we're going behind into the Earth's shadow. Um, and then when we're fully in the Earth's shadow, we would see literally like a red rim, a very thin red rim around the entire planet Earth from the sunlight that's just leaking around the edges of the Earth for that moment. Um, and that's what causes the blood moon is that's the only color light that's reaching the moon 
at that particular point. And let me May tell you, I add something yeah, I, I would actually like you to. I was going to ask you to, to add something because I know you've talked about this before, Daryl. Go right ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as Mark said, if you were standing on the moon during the totality of a, a lunar eclipse and you looked up at the Earth, as Mark said, you would see a red ring around the Earth, which is Earth's atmosphere, refracting the sunlight. Uh, you would literally be seeing every sunrise and sunset on Earth simultaneously as seen from the moon. <clears throat> oh, that's a very cool thing. I never even thought of that, Daryl. Very cool. I didn't see that. That's why Daryl's here. He has these really cool perspectives that I just love. Thank you, Daryl. Oh, yeah, sure. no, it's, that's awesome. That's so cool. You know, it makes looking at Apollo 11 kind of boring, you know. <laughs> You know, however, um, so yes, uh, so that's what causes, uh, that's what causes the, uh, the blood moon. Um, do you have any more questions there, Amanda? Yes. Amal wants to know. Yeah. Um, why is the tidally locked position regarded as stable or equilibrium? Why doesn't the moon, uh, get sort of flipped over on its axis under the influence of Earth's gravity? Well, it's precisely because of the influence of Earth's gravity that it's stuck the way it is. And that's kind of the, uh, it's kind of the uh, opposite uh, mental image that you probably want, Amal. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you how this works. Um, when you have uh, a moon that's close enough to the planet Earth, uh, that, and, and in our case we have that, such that, uh, the, the differential gravitational force on the front of the moon is uh, substantially different from the far side of the moon, then it would tend to uh, uh, lock into position and become tidally locked. Um, what's odd about the moon is that after that happened here, the far side of the moon became denser than the near side from that infrared energy I was telling you about before that was you know, uh, radiatively pushing uh, debris hurled up in nearsight impacts to the far side. Technically, that means that the far side is more dense. It means that the mass of the moon is shifted toward the far side a little bit. So you would expect that maybe the more massive side of the moon might flip around and point at the Earth. Um, well, the, the fact is... Uh, Possibly in a large impact, that could that could happen, and then it would probably stabilize, such that the more massive side is facing us, and we'd have the far side of the moon facing us all the time. However, um, in absence of that, and since the era of bombardment is over uh, for billions of years, it looks like this is where we're going to be from now on. Uh, but it is a very good question, and that's that's what happens with tidally locked situations. Um, and so what that, what that says for us really is that um, we hope that we never have the moon turn around because it means that we will have had a catastrophic impact or either strike the moon or the earth or both as a result of one or the other. So uh, either way, it means the end of the human race. So I'm perfectly happy seeing the near side for now. I want to welcome may Marianne. May I add to that? You may. I just want to welcome Marianne. Uh, Rob, Officer Rob is here. Uh, she is the uh, uh, Arizona-based police officer that I rode with on a ride-along when I was out there for 10 days, and I've never had more fun. Anyway, go ahead now, Daryl. Okay. Uh, I would posit, I'm not sure about this, but I would posit that the heavy side of the moon faces away from us because of centripetal or centripetal force as the moon orbits the earth i understand that as well um but we have tidal locking as the first uh as the first thing that happened before the mass was shifted yes see so um and gravity acts like it toward the center of mass and so with the moon it would be out of balance it was f it's farther away from the earth than uh, closer to the earth um so you could imagine a, a teardrop shape 
objects say, or, or even say a, a, a object like, um, well, let's say like Oumuamua, which is long and slender. And let's assume, let's, let's pretend it had a huge mass at one end. I don't know, it was very, very heavy at one end, made of iron. At the other end, it was made of, say, uh, I don't know, f uh, carbonaceous material that was much lighter density. Um, which end would be tidally locked to us? It depends where the mass is acting from and, and where the uh, gravity is acting from. It would act from the center of the mass. So gravity would only act like that. So it would tend, I think, to pull the more massive side of Oumuamua toward us and let the lighter end swing away until it's tidally locked. So Oumuamua, for instance, if it was tidally locked, would end up being uh, the spindle with the more massive side facing us and the lighter side away. That's, uh, that's how I would imagine it working. See what I mean? Okay. Very cool. How about we go... Um, yeah, go ahead. No, finish your thought. No, no, it's okay, because I was just going to start talking about Apollo 11. Oh, okay, yeah, no, a uh, bunch of questions are coming in okay. now. Okay, good. Um, Daryl, Amal wants to know if you can elaborate a little more on what you were saying about if you were standing on a moon during a blood moon during the eclipse, you would see all the sun, all the sun rises simultaneously. Uh, yeah, well, that's how it's conventionally expressed. Uh, uh, a total lunar, any lunar eclipse happens at the exact moment of full moon. That is of opposition. So, uh, I mean, if there was no eclipse that night, if the alignment wasn't perfect, well, you'd just see a regular bright full moon. Uh, it's when that event of syzygy happens, when you have three objects in a straight line in space, namely the sun, the earth, then the moon, uh, that the total eclipse happens. Uh, the sun is casting the earth's shadow on the face of the moon, which turns it dark. What turns it red is if you were standing on the moon looking up at the earth during the eclipse, you would see a big black circle, which is the earth, a big black dot four times the size of the moon, or about two degrees across, and you would see a red ring around the Earth. Now then, uh, that red ring literally is every sunrise and sunset on Earth simultaneously. You're seeing the dark half of the Earth. Well, imagine if you're on the other side, the sun side, you would see a full planet Earth, of course. Uh, the, the edges of the Earth, when you see it in this case, you're seeing the Terminator all the way around the moon. That is, uh, yeah, the uh, the Earth's Terminator all the way around uh, from the moon. Uh, and that Terminator is the dividing line between light and dark, which is sunrise or sunset, as the case may be. Uh, therefore, when you look up at the Earth, uh, you're seeing the Terminator all the way around the edge, and then you're seeing sunrise or sunset all the way around the Earth. And that red light from all of our sunrises and sunsets is what is illuminating the moon during the eclipse, making it turn that red color. Uh, if you saw Mark's live stream of the eclipse, you might remember that we also noticed quite a blue patch across one side of the, of the, Earth, of the uh, moon. Uh, that was because the eclipse was not perfectly centered on the Earth's shadow, but a little high to one side. And uh, the blue supposedly came from ozone in the Earth's upper atmosphere. So it wasn't just red, but uh, typically that's where the red comes from. I hope that answered your question. I thought it was a good answer. Hey, it made sense to me. I think hopefully it made sense to everyone else listening. Amal commented that it, it was good. So Very good. I hope um, so. Thank you for that question, yeah, Amal. Yeah, again, such a nice way to explain things. Yeah. Now, I, I do want to answer a couple more questions. So, Amanda, if you... There are lots of questions. we got to get to them no, all in, I'm, I'm happy to. in order. I'm happy to. Go for it. Okay. Um, Ted wants to know, at what size do craters become worthy of being named, numbered, or regarded seriously as a feature? You know what? T I can tell you this, Ted. That's, that's a question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, the reason is because, for instance, in this one, in this view we're looking at, 
this crater has a name, okay? Uh, this one does not. This one does not, okay? Uh, it's, it's a matter of, it's not so much the size, but the importance to us for that particular moment. For instance, this was where Apollo 11 landed. And so therefore, we ended up having uh, a crater named this way because our recon uh, of this area was like, hey, let's take a look at uh, you know this area here. And what are we going to call this? Well, let's call this this crater. Uh, I can't actually read it because the, uh, the, the uh, white is superimposed. Um, but again, the naming is done like this for that reason. It's, it's out of convenience. It's not necessarily on size. It has to do with where we are. This one's named, okay, because it's a large feature in the area, okay? But these guys are not, for instance. They're outside the landing zone. This one's here. This was a target. This was actually a navigational uh, crater used for them to identify as they approached. All right. So, you know, that's that. it's not a matter of size uh, and, and so forth. It's a matter of uh, do we need to know what it is based on where we're going or what we're doing. Um, now, uh, as far as, uh, now we, we had a question from, uh, somebody else too, Amanda. We had a few. Yeah. Okay. Go for um, it. Tana wants to know what are IO's oceans full of? Oh, IO. Hey, yeah. Um, IO, IO doesn't have oceans. Uh, IO has a solid surface. Um, but. Io is being flexed by Jupiter uh, as it goes around the planet, all right? It's the closest uh, moon to Jupiter, uh, and it moves the fastest. And as it does, uh, Jupiter is tugging on Io, and at certain points in Io's orbit, it's getting pulled and squished, pulled and squished. Now, why would it? You would think it would be all stable after all these billions of years. Well, Io is not the only moon, okay? We have other moons that are farther out from Io. And Amanda will name them because she knows them. The moons of Jupiter? The Galilean moons? You got it. Um, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Oh, very good. And she got them in the right order this time. Very good. And because E comes before G. Oh, good Europa Monica. comes before Ganymede. Good metaphor. Yeah, <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> Folks, I got to tell you, we are proud of her because she came from a point where she didn't know uh, anything about astronomy. And now... And I even called them the Galilean moons. And she... Me extra I, was, I was actually getting to that. <gasps> and now she knows the Galilean moons and not only what their, name, that, what their names are too, but that they're Galilean moons. Um, first tracked by Galileo and he noted their positions, which got him in tremendous amount of trouble when he suggested that not everything revolves around the Earth. Oh, so, I knew that theory, too. Ah, uh, you see? Oh, just when I think you don't well, know Well, I was going to guess it, I assumed, but... That's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> so... I'm sorry. I, I always just solid surface, okay? And, and because it's being squished, uh, you say, as I said, you would think that maybe it would have entered into a stable orbit and only have a certain amount of squish. Why is it getting squished differentially uh, like that? Why would it be squished at all? Well, the answer is because the other moons that are out there beyond Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are also tugging on Io. And when they do, they pull on Io just a little bit, and they pull it away from being a perfectly circular orbit and give it a slight, what we call, eccentricity, a little bit of an elliptical orbit. That process over billions of years when Io is pulled a little further away by a moon farther out, causes Io to feel less gravitational force from uh, Jupiter. And then as it gets closer, it feels more. Well, what's the translation of that? The translation is that it's like a ball being squished slightly and then released, squished and released, squished and released. What does squish and release do to a solid moon? Well, it makes the interior very hot because it's creating friction. All right. And this is a tidal friction based on the, uh, the, the way the gravitational forces are being applied to that moon. And so that is why Io has a molten interior. 
And what happens is that spews, you see that uh, Io actually has plumes uh, first identified by one of our early probes looking at it. Um, and that plume was found to be sulfur, molten sulfur, spewing off the moon. Uh, molten sulfur is red, but it's not nearly as hot as lava. Um, and uh, I've actually touched molten sulfur. Yes, it burns, but it, it's not, it doesn't burn through a table. It just sits there on top of the table. Um, I know that because I was a kid playing with molten sulfur. I think this was, this was just before, this was again playing with my chemistry set. You think some of you have heard me say this. And just before, uh, I think this happened just before I, I, I blew a gigantic stain up onto the ceiling of my bedroom when a test tube full of some concoction I was making exploded and went pew and went up and went up against the ceiling. I was like, oh, my mother's going to kill me. And it never painted over. It wouldn't take paint. Yeah, so I was a real terror. Um, but my chemistry set, oh, that was so much fun. I couldn't wait to get home from school and play with the chemistry set. So um, I made gunpowder. I mean, back then we could make gunpowder. Well, anyway, uh, so sulfur is hot. And when it's not molten, when it's hardened, it's yellow. And when it's molten, it's red. Uh, and it stinks, as the <clears throat> smell in my bedroom would attest to, which drifted out into the living room and then the kitchen, uh, which made my parents think that there was a gas leak. Uh, yeah, and I got stories. So anyway, the sulfur uh, is something that is uh, really what's inside of Io and spews out onto the surface. It explains the reddish, yellow, mostly hue uh, to, to Io that we see. Uh, and there's a number of volcanic uh, sulfur volcanoes on Io. So Io is made mostly of that sulfur. Okay. So next question. I'm sorry. That was a little long. Okay, no problem. Um, Laura wants to know, does the ghost moon influence orbit of our moon? <laughs> Actually... That's a very interesting question, Laura, and I'll tell you why. Because we didn't really even know that we had another potential object orbiting the Earth. Uh, and it's actually, the, the jury's still out. We're not saying we definitely have a second moon. Uh, but I bet you that perked up the attention of some of you. The fact that we might? And the answer is, yeah. Now, it's very small, and it, it's probably a captured asteroid, if anything. But the fact is that... Uh, it's on such a strange orbit, uh, and, and it's so small that we don't think that it's actually influencing the moon uh, very much at all. The moon is so much more massive compared to it. Um, but uh, further study will indicate and tell us whether the current position of our moon is related possibly to some type of long, you know, ancient interaction with this other object that's out there, if indeed it is a second moon of the Earth, it's not in our it's not it, in our orbit can, in any way. Can a moon Mark? have an, a moon? Uh, like that little captured asteroid orbit the moon? No, I don't. I don't believe that it would ever do that because it's the moon. Our moon is too close to us. Oh. Yes, Daryl. Uh, I'd like to pipe in for a second. We talked about this uh, so-called ghost moon a few nights ago. Yeah. Uh, and that reminded me at the time. Uh, uh, did not? Did they not discover? Uh, they thought they saw something orbiting out a little beyond the moon. Uh, not this uh, ghost moon, but uh, what eventually turned out to be one of the Apollo upper stages, the Saturn upper stages. Oh well, that that was yeah that wasn't that wasn't the ghost moon though yes. Yes, that's what I mean. It was not the ghost moon, but they okay. they were tracking something else out there in sort of a similar situation, and they eventually figured out that it was one of the uh, Saturn upper stages from one of the Apollo launches. Yeah, that's true. And and we you know we actually have some very interesting uh, uh, results. Uh, from the lunar surface that show us some interesting impact from these upper stages um you know and they had the uh the uh, stage four for instance the the fourth stage uh the, that powered the lunar module and the command module and the service module to the moon okay uh was of course 
uh, 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 ejected basically from the overall uh, spacecraft and, and allowed to drift down and collide with the moon. And uh, that they, they mapped all the impact sites and they made artificial craters. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, this says this is the Saturn IV impact, and uh, I'm sorry, the uh, stage four impact from here. Look at this. Look at that impact. That's the impact. Wow. It's 100 meters across. Now, that's, that's like debris in there from the impact. But this is the Apollo 13 uh, upper stage, the Saturn IV-B upper stage. Now, Apollo 13 couldn't land on the moon, but they had to circle the moon and come home. And when they did, to do that, they had to get rid of this upper stage uh, of, the, of the Saturn IV-B upper stage. And they did, and it collided with the moon. And look at it. It made rays and everything. Yeah, it was a heck of a, a crash. And this is what it looks like. This is what they actually hit the moon with. Cool. Yeah, isn't that crazy? And, of course, the seismometers on the moon uh, recorded uh, you know, at, at various different uh, locations on the moon the impact. See? Really cool. And this is the seismic station on the moon. This is what it looks like. Yeah. So anyway, so that's pretty cool. That's a neat little uh, uh, little bit of uh, background there. But yes, yeah, some of these places on the moon, uh, and I don't, and sometimes the labels here aren't exactly where they have to be. And that's, that's troublesome because I wanted to show you that. But this isn't the only place where the uh, the upper stage is it's not this it's not here it might be underneath this I gotta I might have to um I might have to just reduce the uh, opacity here see if it's there it might be that right there actually I'm not sure um, it's in a it's in a lower resolution image now though here um, so there are more though. We can find other ones where these other impact sites of these uh, uh, upper stages. Um, and that was the Apollo 13. But here, about it. here's the Apollo 14 uh, Saturn 4B impact crater. Let's see if this one's in a better position. Because I've seen several that really look good. It might be. Uh, the labels, like I said, are never directly on them. It's not this, not over there. Uh, it might actually be this. Actually, I think it's this. I, I think that they didn't get it close enough, but I, I believe it's that. And I'm almost certain of that. So you can see this debris chunk in here. And you can see that it makes a circular crater. Now, if you don't think that's the one, let's test me here and go look at it because I'm sure there's a, a link to it. I'll be right back. Okay, and that's, yeah, that's the one. See that? So you can see the debris in there. And uh, that is, oh, that's a good photo. I've never seen this picture before. This is a photo of the uh, Saturn IV B upper stage uh, as it was jettisoned. And as it was heading down to the moon, that's pretty cool. It is. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Mark, uh, Amal asked a question or two about the size of the moon and eclipses. He, he specifically asked for you to answer it. Uh, if you do that, I might want to chime in afterwards, though, please. Yeah. What, what, what was this question? I missed it. Oh, wait. Let me see here. Um how interesting it is that the moon's size is just about uh, good for eclipses. According to me, size wouldn't... Okay, well, you know what? That's actually... Uh, that's very, a very good question. And, and he says, like, uh, um, we would still have had eclipses with smaller or larger moon. Um, how do you debunk that conspiracy? Actually, it's really not a conspiracy to me because the moon isn't the exact size. Um we sometimes see an edge of the sun around the moon, uh, and that is an annular eclipse where we don't actually see the moon cover the entire sun. And when we see the uh, the moon, when we see the uh, sun actually uh, uh, in a proper total eclipse, um, we 
we actually see uh, artifacts at the edges, you know, things that are called like Bailey's beads. It's actually where lunar mountains are low enough and, 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 and uh, valleys in between the mountains are low enough where we actually see sunlight coming through. Um, so uh, it's, it's sort of coincidental that the sun is 400 times further away uh, than the moon, which is 400 times smaller kind of a thing. Uh, and that's, a, that's really just a coincidental thing. But the moon isn't a perfectly, it's not perfect. I mean, we do end up, uh, you know, having times when we don't see uh, a perfect eclipse, uh, solar eclipse. Um, so I'm, to me, it doesn't seem very strange at, at all to me. But uh, Daryl will uh, tell us more because I think you have some ideas too. Go ahead, tell people, man. I do. Okay, um, all, uh the moon uh, used to be closer to the Earth than it is now. It used to be significantly closer a very long time ago. That's right. Uh, uh, this is conservation of angular momentum is what it's called. You can look it up if you're really curious about it. Uh, tidal effects of the moon on the Earth are robbing rotational energy <laughs> from the Earth and the energy has to go somewhere and where it goes is the moon is slowly moving farther away from the earth it's like just uh inches a year two centimeters yeah, the, it's two centimeters two a centimeters year. Yeah. yes uh but that adds up over millions and billions of years uh, uh the uh I, I stopped a physics professor on a call-in show with this once because he didn't know the answer uh uh, in the far future, the moon is going to be much farther away, and it will no longer be 400 times closer, but 400 times smaller than the sun. So, see, that's where you get that coincidence in size that gives us neat total solar eclipses when they happen. Uh, in the future, the moon is going to be farther away. It will no longer be able to completely cover the sun. And that's when we will get annular eclipses, as Mark mentioned, uh, whenever there is a solar eclipse. There will be no more total solar eclipses. That's right. Uh, this is sort of a lucky time in the lifetime of the Earth and the Moon, and a lucky time for us that we are able to see this now, because it will not happen at some point in the future. Yeah, Does that, that make sense? It makes sense to me, and uh, I'm sure that he can add more comments if he's... Uh... If he has some uh, more to make there, that's a good good answer, though, Daryl. And oh. and here's the thing, you know, um, Earth's day was a lot uh, a lot shorter in the past. Yes. So yeah. uh, our, our now, of course, with the with the moon robbing angular momentum from the Earth, uh, basically angular velocity of the Earth, um, and as it's rotating, I'm sorry, as it's moving farther away, Earth's rotating a little bit slower each time uh you know as, as time moves on so our day is continuously getting uh, uh longer all right and uh you might ask the question will there ever be a time when the moon will be uh so f so far away that it's no longer gravitationally bound to the earth well if the universe was uh forever then yes however that time will come long after the sun has died uh, and had the sun just died in place without doing anything uh, catastrophic, well, then the moon could eventually become free of the earth. But the uh, sun is going to swell to a red giant, and it's going to swallow the earth most likely, and the earth would become a cinder, and the moon, of course, a cinder. So it would be evaporated. So, uh, yeah, so it's not going to, won't happen uh, ever, I believe. So. And I'm back. Good for you. I'm How glad. How far did we get in the questions? I answered, Welcome. and we both answered Amal's question about uh, a conspiracy. Conspiracies, okay. Did you get Tim's? Uh, Tim's question was uh, tons There's of speculation ten, about yeah. pictures and anomalies on the moon. I did a, a Netflix special called Aliens on the Moon. Uh, that was a, a Robert Kiviat production. Uh, I'm going to see Bob actually in a couple weeks in Las Vegas because uh, we're going to, uh, uh, I got to go speak at a conference out there and uh, he's going to be there and uh, we're going to sit down for a, a bit and, and talk. Um, 
he showed me a bunch of pictures and I looked at them and noticed, you know, that they were very, uh, I say misrepresented photos. They didn't, they didn't look like anything special to me. Uh, and I told him, um, but unfortunately, uh, he didn't uh, put that into the final special, right? I, he got me saying things like, wow, that's very interesting. But then when they went to say, but here's what it is, that's the part that didn't really get you know, brought across properly, <laughs> you know. But I'll talk to him about that when I see him in, in a couple of weeks. So I don't believe that there's uh, anything to the conspiracies. I think that people that zoom in on the photos, uh, they see pixelation and call it structure uh, because they don't understand that there's image compression going on. All right. Um, uh, many of the images I've seen, like this guy right here, this thing right here uh, can be characterized as the as a dome. This could look like a dome. It could be a radar dome on the moon, you see. And I was told that that a number of the objects on the moon were actually domes, not craters. Yet, if you look at the obvious craters, okay, uh, and you compare the shadows, you see they're the same. The shadows on the right side here, the shadows on the right side here. This is deeper than this, okay? This has a narrow cross-section, so it's got less of a uh, uh, depth than this crater over here, okay? So if this was a dome, then the shadow would be on the other side, okay? It wouldn't be, uh, you know, because the light's coming from this right side here and hitting the wall of the crater, and so it's illuminating this brightly, and then it's illuminating the edge here, but then we see a shadow where the light's missing, and it illuminates the debris in the middle of the crater. On this one, we should see that it's, if it was actually a dome, well, the far side of the dome would be in shadow. See? And this side should be brightly illuminated. And it's not. These are all craters and not domes. And to help them see things in a proper, uh, in a proper light, so to speak, you can actually rotate the image upside down to where you're looking at it with your eye or just stand up and turn your head over and suddenly craters that look like domes become craters again and that's kind of interesting because one of the problems that we have and I'm going to zoom out here of the impact the Apollo 14 impact crater for the Saturn 4b is that when we look at things like rills uh, and what are rills well let's go to uh, let's go over here let's go over to uh, Oh, where are we? I want to get to my Apollo 15 site again because there's an interesting... That looks very interesting. I had a problem with this as a kid. Okay. Looking at Hadley Rill. Okay. I There was a tendency to think that this was a raised ridge. Uh, and the mind could see that as a raised ridge. And once it saw that as a raised ridge, it stayed that way. And you couldn't get out of it. Uh, and so the only way to fix it was to turn it upside down, spin it around, spin the image upside down. I can't do that with the browser. Uh, and we actually, actually we could do it in a 3D uh, globe, I believe. Uh, but you would never be able to do that. Uh, you'd never be able to, in other words, see this as a, uh, as a fully uh, raised, it wouldn't be a raised ridge. You could actually see it as a, uh, like what it is, a depression very easily uh, just by flipping it upside down, like I said. Now, if we come down to the ground here, okay, you can see that there are rocks and stuff that have migrated down into the bottom of the gully, all right? Well, rocks don't migrate to the top of a hill. They migrate off the top of a hill. And so if there was a tendency to think that this was a, uh, a raised area with rocks on it, this would prove you uh, prove this this image here would prove that it's not because this actually shows that rocks have rolled down and ended up in this gully okay uh, there's another there's another uh, crater that I want to look at to show you some of that you can actually see uh, that it's over here I think I think it's might be this guy let's just take a look I want to look for uh, the boulder trails you know what I'm talking about Daryl 
Daryl, you're on yes, mute. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. Uh, Sorry, I was on mute. I know, that's okay. I was, uh, in case you hadn't noticed, I was trying to remind you. I'm trying to find the, uh, the crater that has the boulder trails. There's a lot of them, actually. Um, and I'm sure I could find them, but you, you, there's, some of these rocks have rolled downhill. And I thought it was the, I thought it was the crater next to, uh, Plato. I thought it was that one, but maybe it's, maybe it's this one. There's, there's several. I mean, there's, there's millions of them, okay, on the moon, but, uh, I'm sure. I'm just trying to locate the ones that I I want to show you because you can actually see the trail they leave behind and how they actually picked up momentum and just bounced a few times. Uh, and I want to show you. I thought it was here. I thought it was here. Well, I know it's, it's sort of coming up empty here, but I'm trying to find it. I wish I could help you, but I can't. That's okay. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about it. I know that it's, it's a crater near here, near Plato. I will find it. I will find it. Okay, this, this is an interesting crater though, actually. Here, this one, you can see something else happened in this crater. Okay. You can see that this crater had debris and stuff that kind of settled into its middle part here. And then sometime later, a landslide occurred that covered over with a tongue of material covered over that bottom of the crater. See that? And it could have been from another impact, uh, maybe from the, this crater perhaps. Uh, and, and that's actually really interesting too. And, oh wait, okay, here's some gullies. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, this shows you areas where stuff has subsided and fallen down into the crater. Uh, it's not the boulder trails I was telling you about, but you can see that this is an area here that that's happened at. And if you go up to the edge of the crater, um, you can see that bedrock that those layers have been exposed here. Uh, these are just, it's just beautiful stuff here. And then, um, I'm trying to find, uh, I mean, wouldn't you like to just like hike down into these things? I think this would be fun. Oh, if I was a younger man, maybe. Oh, you don't want to try it now? Yeah, let, let's see what we're talking about anyway. Let's see if we're talking about something that would be impossible. So let's, let's, let's do a measurement across here. What are we looking at? Well, when I was young and wanted to be an astronaut, sure, but <laughs> I, I don't think I'd pass the test nowadays, you know? Well, not many of us would. Actually, uh, if John Glenn could fly uh, in in a in fly in the space shuttle and fly up to uh, orbit, uh, I don't see why you couldn't. You're way younger than John Glenn. This okay. is true. Yeah, so this is minus 3,500 meters. <clears throat> in the middle and you can see how this area here <clears throat> is a slightly gentler slope than the far side and again that's just a scaled slope and you can see it's it's that way because this material has filled in the crater and left this uh unaffected over here i just i i just never get tired i mean when i get bored i just go look at the lunar reconnaissance orbiter stuff you know Look at all this debris. They got blown out of this crater, you know? Look at it all. And, and we're not even just the highest resolution here. Let's try something. I want to figure out, say, how big that rock is right there. So let's go grab an arc and let's start it here. And just end it here. <clears throat> now, this doesn't count much, but look at this. It's, um... The distance is 0 0.025 kilometers. So, uh, what's that mean? Well, there's a thousand kilometers in uh, a meter. I'm sorry, in a, a thousand, thousand meters in a kilometer. So, this is a 25 meter rock right here. So, it's like 0 0.025 kilometers. 
to get meters, you multiply this by a thousand. So that means move over three decimal places, zero, two, and five. So 25 meters long. That's how long that is. And we can see stuff a lot smaller, can't we? You know, we can see stuff a lot smaller. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's measure this rock right here. I hope I can remember that rock when I come back. Okay, right there. So we're going to go here and here. <coughs> Excuse me again. <clears throat> okay. Look at that. That's a, that's a, that rock is only about 12 feet across right there. Isn't that crazy? <clears throat> so 0 0.004 kilometers, which is four meters. That's wild. <clears throat> so that's, that's the resolution we're getting here. Just amazing wow. resolution. <clears throat> it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then, may I, may I, I'm sorry, no, no, may I say something? <coughs> uh, I don't think no matter how young or old I was, I can, could ever have carried John Glenn's uh, jock scrap. So, <laughs> there. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, um, it's an awful big strap to fill, I guess, you know, uh, for what he's done. Um, yeah. Which I think is what you were implying. Question. I think you may have missed I right, go for it. Uh, John Wallace wants to know, is there a camera up there? <clears throat> Actually, uh, yes, but they're not active. Hmm. Uh, um, they're the cameras that are there from the uh, last missions. Um, uh, American, okay. Chinese, yeah, the Chinese have uh, an active camera on their far side mission. Um and that's and you know the only other camera that's active up there, of course, is the LROC, uh, you know, lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera. You know, you follow? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was just I was just responding to someone in chat. They wanted to know if this was an image or live. It was just saying it was the LROC Quick View. Oh app. yes, yes, it's the Quick View. And I think Quick View map. Yep. I think I still have... No, I don't. It was copying and pasting questions. Hold on, I'll get the link. Okay. <clears throat> May I add one other thing? Sure. Uh, I am a fan of the Grand Tour on Amazon. These are the guys who used to do Top Gear for the BBC, okay? okay. Well, they had a new episode of uh, Grand Tour out yesterday, and James May talked about the Apollo astronauts. Okay. Now, it's a car show, so he talked about the cars the Apollo astronauts drove, uh, and it was interesting, but he made some good points about the astronauts themselves. Uh, uh, and he compared the Apollo astronauts to modern day astronauts who he said if you look at modern astronauts now, you know, they look like they could be working in a in a store or something, uh, just that they were not the heroic figures that the Apollo astronauts mm -hmm. were or were made out to be. Mm -hmm. Uh and a really interesting part of this episode, though, is toward the end of the part, uh, the end of the part about the Apollo astronauts, uh, James Bay gets to drive Neil Armstrong's Corvette. <laughs> Most of the Apollo astronauts got Corvettes, or a lot of the astronauts, uh, period, back in the early days of the space race, all drove Corvettes because it was the thing to do, uh, the Apollo astronauts in particular. But some guy went out and found Neil Armstrong's Corvette and uh, did not restore it because he wanted to preserve it, you know, for its historicity, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. Uh, and James May actually got to drive Neil Armstrong's Corvette. That's it funny. is a really cool thing to see on the show. So mm -hmm. if you get Amazon Prime and you watch Grand Tour, be sure and watch mm -hmm. Episode 9, Series 3, Episode 9, because that's excellent. All right. That's very cool. So if you have Amazon Prime, make sure you do that. Check out Grand Tour on Amazon Prime. Episode 9, Series 3? Is, is it from yes. uh, Season 3? Season 3, Episode 9, yeah. Okay, Season 3, Episode 9. Very cool. It's really cool. Thank you, Daryl. That was wonderful. Sorry. For what? For giving us oh, wonderful I information? Keep, I keep... 
I keep digressing and interrupting oh, you. Oh, stop. Jeez. I'm just sitting here babbling. You're not babbling. <laughs> if you're if you're we'll a see. if you're a babbler, uh, you know I wouldn't have you on, man. I mean, you're just a you're actually a, a font of wonderful knowledge. Oh, yeah, it's good. I'm that's a what we need here. Cliff Clavin. <sighs> yeah, let's see. Yeah, you know, uh, it's a little known fact. You know, okay, you just have to start it with that. You know, it's a little known fact. You know, a normie. Uh, you have to you have to do it like that. You know, if anyone remembers Cliff Clavin. From Cheers. I don't right. remember him. Uh, the mailman. From from Jeopardy. Uh, Jeopardy? Cliff Clavin from Jeopardy. He was on an episode of Jeopardy. That was his biggest goal was to get on an episode oh. of Jeopardy. No? Okay. okay. Maybe, no, maybe, Never mind. maybe that was a Cheers episode where Cliff Clavin got on Jeopardy. Yeah, it okay. was. Okay, I didn't see that. That's uh, funny. Yeah, I know that there's. I'm still trying to find uh, the Boulder Trail, uh, and I know they're here. Actually, they. So there's other things too. So we looked at the uh, Apollo stuff, and so I don't need to see that anymore. However, let me. Let me do something else. Let me actually see if. Uh, if I can actually uh, search for this and that's something that I think would be interesting um, let me do that and where was my search feature for this mm hmm I thought I had I'm just trying to get to the search feature where was that I thought that was down here Oh, here it is. Duh. It's right in front of me. Sorry, guys. Um, I want to see if uh, if it's known by this. I think I've seen uh, the list before. Um, uh, maybe Boulder Fields. There it is. Boulder Trails, Manilas. Okay, this is good. So now, uh, yeah, this is a boulder trail. Um, I just want to show how it, how these things uh, do move. Uh, hold on one second. You can actually see them here. They're very, they're in the light. A little bit left of center. Yeah, I gotta. I About gotta, halfway down, left to center. Saw some other straight lines in there also. Yeah, there were some there, but I want to get to an area where they they're better contrast. I know that this maybe like over here. It's just fun looking at the moon. There's no doubt about it. You know, you can get lost looking at this stuff. In some of these steeper areas, you will find more trails. All right. So this is one meter per pixel. Uh, at this, I mean, we could literally, as a researcher, you could end up spending your entire day or week in one crater. Well, I mean, here they are. I mean, there's you can see the trails here, and you'll notice that they're not, uh, they're not, you see them? They're not perfect uh, lines either, like the bowler was rolling down the hill uh, without interruption. It was actually bouncing, so it was leaving the moon's surface because it's only one-sixth the gravity, and uh, it, could, it would bounce downhill. See? Ends here, so it came bouncing down here. This one's pretty long. Uh, and there's there's others I'm sure. Uh, small boulder rich crater. Okay, right. <coughs> Peter's not visible in this projection. Yes, it's probably on the far far side. Okay, boulder fields, boulder crater. 
All the trails are already looked at. So more. And these are by far not the only ones here. I promise you. I just uh, thought I thought these are these are pretty good. There's some that are pretty good, but you can actually see uh, some actually that they don't list because they're so common. But you know, I mean this this one is pretty visible because it's you can see that it has this you know it's like bang it hit bang it hit bang it hit bang it hit it bounce bum 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 and it stops here. You know, and you might say, well, how big is that boulder? I'm glad you asked. Let's go back and check it out. So we're going to put our first point right there. And the second point right there. That boulder right there is four meters across. So it's like, you know, between, uh, uh, you know, it's actually, you know, gosh, it's, it's, that's going to be like 14 feet across, you know. But that's pretty good. But it bounced quite a distance. Might have come from this impact here, or it might have originated way uphill, but the boulder trail doesn't start till about here. But that's really cool. <laughs> my lights are, are dimmed. I don't like my dim lights. All right. We got our, we got our moonlight back, folks. Back in the lava lamp. <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, I have, um, because the lights are Wi-Fi, I do have an application <coughs> that can just migrate the lights around to different colors. <clears throat> uh huh. And one of the uh, settings that I, I I developed is one called Lava, and uh, you just see different shades of red come and go. Uh, and there's another one called aquarium where you feel like you're in the bottom of an aquarium with all the like the colors and lighter blues and darker blues changing around you it's funny as heck it's a lot cool. of fun yeah but that was early when I got them and now I just use them they're utilitarian for me well there we go and uh, so that's really cool and that's on both sides uh, the Sea of Serenity Mayor Serenitatis you know and I want to show you something here at Posidonius. This uh, Posidonius is a, a interesting crater because it has this feature in it right here. Uh, and this is one of those features that I was saying before can look like it's a raised area to you. Remember what I said? Uh, looks like it's raised. You know, to a lot of people, they say, "Look, it's like a it's a surface feature." It's not. It's actually a depression. Well, wait, how do you know that? I'll show you. I will do this. I will take a section through it. And what are you going to see? We're going to see that it goes down in the middle. Look at that. It goes down in the middle and up on the other side. So as we close in, it becomes a little more obvious. It's actually a pit. See? Here's the crater, too. This is a crater. This is a crater. Here's a crater. Notice the dark side of the crater here. It means that the light's coming from the right. And if the light's coming from the right to illuminate this side of the crater, the wall of the crater causes a shadow to fall into the crater a little bit. The wall of the slope causes the shadow to fall into the chasm a little bit. You see? And that's how this works. Use other craters nearby to prove that your eyes are just being fooled. And you can use this... Uh, you can use this uh, tool here, you know, in the search, you know, you say it's the drawn search tool, drawn arc, you know, and the, the polygon allows you to circle a crater, for instance, and see the amount of surface area that it uh, takes up, which is kind of neat. Um, so really, let's, let's kind of just go over this one more time. Overall, if we're looking at here, we, we show up here and we show up to, uh, when we show up here in, in this uh, view, uh, we are met with the following. We're met with um, what we see here. This is what we see, okay? And, and uh, some people are saying that it's kind of hard to see. Um, so the blue line gives depth 
What does the yellow give? Well, I mentioned we talked about it before. The uh, those are two different uh, missions to get data from the moon. Uh, the green line. Um, okay, I'll show you. Let's go okay. to Copernicus. Okay, and let's do a a, a line through uh, Copernicus. Okay, if we start here and cross cross Copernicus, let's do it again. From here to here, go cross through the central area. All right, this is the exaggerated view here. So as we move across Copernicus, we get to the central peak. The peak has a, uh, a height which is given here. Those numbers will make themselves very clear to you. If you can't read them in the stream, um, uh, remember, you got to be in 1080p um, uh, for this. So, uh, if you can't read them, you will, you'll see them on the playback, or you can do them for yourself too. But we're talking about uh, a crater that's approximately 93 kilometers across. Okay, and we're seeing that it has this terraced walls and has a central peak. It's a complex crater for sure. All right, now the if we look at the yellow lines, see here they kind of match up, but if we if we do, and that's because it's uh, averaged over a very large distance. If we do a smaller distance, just like, say, this area, all right, then we'll see a difference, okay, because we're generally trending from up high, down low here, you can see. And if we go to the detailed chart, we get the white screen, which actually gives us a very detailed chart. This is actually a new feature, new since the last time we did this. Look down below, there's a, 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 a data source indicator. This is a data source. It's a, a 100 meter data, which means that uh, that's its resolution. This is data that was taken more recently, and it's, it's LOLA data, uh, which is laser altimetry. They actually measure with a laser aiming at the moon, and this green line represents uh, more accurate data. It generally follows the lower resolution data, which is the gold, but there is a difference between them. Okay, the gold is, is older, and we can turn off that data and turn on, and leave only on the, uh, the good data. Okay, uh, and that's, that's how this works, okay? So if we end up, uh, we can turn off the, the data here too, uh, but this... That's what these two lines mean. It's two different sets of data, and the, the little uh, legend here tells us this is 100 meter data, and this is data that shows us uh, uh, much higher resolution. All right, I don't know the exact resolution of those uh, those dems from uh, that was looks like it's this 2015. Uh, it's it's SL that tells us something too. I forgot what the SL means, but SL dems. Um, plus the Lola, uh, you know, mean uh, more accurate data. And you can just imagine how crazy it was in Copernicus Crater uh, right after that impact. You know, look at look at the turbulent, broken uh, basin left behind within Copernicus. And that's huge. That's a large area. There's lots of boulders strewn around. Look at that. You know, the boulders are all throughout. Amazing. I've said before that Copernicus looks different to me than most lunar <laughs> craters. Uh, most lunar craters, when you look at them, they pretty obviously went bang. You look at Copernicus there, if you can zoom back in just a touch, and Copernicus looks like it went splat. Didn't go bang, it went splat. Looks like a big, you know, like you dropped a rock in a mud hole or something. Huh. Well, and that you can kind of see with these aprons are exactly. around Copernicus. You know, these aprons seem to indicate that something was more like a slurry of material, um, which is very interesting. And these aren't the only craters that look that way. This one has a slurry around it as well. In fact, it's more, uh, more of a splash-looking crater than even Copernicus, see? Uh -huh. See this outer area here? Um, and uh, this is uh, Eratosthenes. And uh, we actually make a 3D model, every one of these craters. 
uh, actually. So if you're interested in having a seeing, having a 3D printed model that looks beautiful and just like this, um, you know, we make these little four inch plates of all these craters. Um, so you, you'll like it. We we every one of them that we've made, we've sold. Uh, people love them, and you know, we sell them for like I don't know twenty or twenty five dollars. It's they're just a blast, you know. Um, and all someone has to do is they can go to our store um, at fxmodels.com, look in the store there and get them, or they can go to the FX Models Planetary Replicas page on Facebook and buy them there. So if you guys want something uh, like that, let me know. Uh, and uh, some folks want to get um, you know different areas of the moon, <clears throat> and we can get down to a certain resolution. I actually have pretty good resolution uh, of the moon because I'm I've, I've been talking to the United States Geological Survey guys that curate the data um, and I can print a crater uh, from anywhere on the moon anywhere on Mars um, a lot of the asteroid or dwarf planet series all the places we saw on Pluto with the New Horizons spacecraft I have all the Pluto data um, it's literally amazing it's, it's reams and reams and reams of data uh, and so I can just uh, identify where I want to get, uh, you know, the data from and get this high resolution data. So I can, I can get Copernicus down like, you know, this big or, you know, this big, which includes other craters in it. And when we paint them, we paint them realistically to show the rays and everything, too. Uh, and there's certain people, some people in the chat actually have some of our craters. Um, I have one. And you have one as well. Tycho, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, you're right. You got Tycho Crater, which is this guy down here, right there. That's Tycho. Uh, Tycho is a cool crater. It is. It's another complex crater with terraced walls. Um, and there's supposedly a huge boulder sitting on top of the uh, on top of one of the peaks in Tycho, also. Well, then let's go. Can look you for zoom it. in on it and see? Sure. That's what I like to do. Let's go see. There's some missing data here. Now see the There's conspiracy. Big there, I don't know if that's the one they're talking about. Which yeah, one? missing data. Yeah, they, this is. They say that's because there's a base inside Tycho. They don't want us to see it. Actually, it's in shadow. There's actually more data here. You can just barely see it. Yeah. So uh -huh. it was from a strip of of, of the uh, of the Tycho data that where Tycho was actually not illuminated fully. You can see the shadow here. So. I don't see the big, big boulder you're talking about. I mean, there's that one. There's that one, yeah. I saw that a second ago. I don't know if that's it or not, but... Well, we should find out now how big the boulder is. I know. Sure. Let's go here and find out. Okay, so let's take a image of it from here. And I can just see it ending right there. And it is. Wow. Look at that. It's 112 meters in size. That's pretty good. That's 112 meters in size. And that, that's, and that's uh, we're down, if you look at the bottom here, this is your resolution and your location, uh, Latin, latitude and longitude. And uh, if you notice, it's we're at the half meter per pixel size. It's the highest resolution. So the smallest objects we can see here are only a few meters across. And the largest ones, of course, <laughs> very big. This is a massive boulder. And maybe that's the one they're talking about. Could be. It's not in a peak, though. Yeah. Um, which is okay, but it's uh, it's still in, it's on a peak. It's uh, Actually, why don't I just measure it, right? We can actually go and measure that. We don't have to. Let's see. Where's that boulder? Uh, we have another question here. All right, good. Uh, David wants to know, uh, it, in this particular site or app or however you'd like to phrase it, uh, when he goes to the settings tab on the site, yep. he sees a button that says download PNG and VRT. What yep. are those? Uh, they're, they're graphics formats. The uh, PNG is the uh, portable network graphics format. Uh, VRT, I, I don't... Uh, I'm not sure, but they're not 3D formats. These are image formats. 
Okay, and that's so. Always... It's just if you want to like save pictures from the site, or. Yeah. See. Um, yes. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I think it's um, VRT is probably. Uh, uh, hmm. What is VRT? A virtual. Uh, vir ray trace, maybe. Um, let me just see. I, I can. I'm no, I was just wondering. Okay, he wanted to know, and no, I know. I, I wanted pretty just... familiar with the site, so. Yeah. Um, I think it's. I'm trying to see if it's uh. I want. I think. I'm trying to see if it's actually the. Uh, the. Uh, the format for a virtual. Uh, 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 hang on, I'm just looking. Wow, that music got loud. Yeah, okay. That's because I'm only thinking. That's actually because the music was off by accident. Okay. Yeah, see, it's a okay. It's a it's a three D format. Um, and that's new and you can you can actually it's a VR, the VRT format's a new it's a, it's a 3D format so it's possible that we can uh, download uh, let's just see what it does why don't I just do it okay I'm going to just save this and let's see if it's there Raymond man thank wow, you wow Raymond now I'm going to open this file and I see what we got. Too much. I bet Raymond's in Las Vegas. It's like he's plugging coins into a slot machine <laughs> or something. There <laughs> yeah. Well then. You're a heck of a guy, Raymond. Then we're the well, then we're the slot machine here. He's he's really, uh, you know, he's helping us uh, tremendously. Okay, so let's see what the ping is that we download. We can just double click on this. Yeah, see that. This is the ping that we just downloaded. Actually, you can't see that because it's not in the window that you can see. But it was actually, <clears throat> it was the image that was just like uh, what you see on the screen now. So that's good. All right, so now I know what it does. So I'll store that there and then I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can play with the VRT stuff and figure out what, what else is going on with it. But this is beautiful and all, this is, you know, again, <clears throat> we make 3D prints about this resolution. <clears throat> we can't get down like this close to see stuff at this level, you know, in our 3D prints, because that's not uh, that data is not <clears throat> reproducible at the resolution uh, that we have. But we can show a semblance of it. You can see it like this. You can see this this type of stuff in there, <clears throat> but you couldn't see. Like all these these little tiny cracks, you wouldn't see that, but you would definitely see, like this. You'd see that modeling. You'd see this raised area. <clears throat> it looks beautiful. You like your Tyco there, uh, Daryl? Oh yeah, sitting right here next to me. Awesome, that's very cool. I'm gonna, on my desk. Yep, yeah. awesome. Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna uh, and Amanda, if you got any more questions, let me know. No, we are all caught up for now. Awesome. But I am still keeping my eye on chat, so I'll let you know. Okay, because I'm going to We finally do... hit the bottom. I'm so happy I can breathe for a minute. <clears throat> Good. So this is what you hey, see. March. Yeah. Show us Rupee's recta. Rupee's recta. All right. The straight wall. Uh, where, are, where is that now? Is that over... What, what uh, sea are we in? It's above Clavius, uh, sort of... To the upper left there of Tycho, I think. <clears throat> well, this is Clavius, where yes. the famous uh, uh, moon base is in 2001 A Space Odyssey. And if you go up <clears throat> from there... <clears throat> There's Tycho. Okay. And isn't it out here somewhere? There it it's is. It's kind of to the upper left of Clavius. Yeah, I, I, actually, I got it. It's right here. 
Oh, okay. That's Rupi's Recta right there. That's uh, This is a great telescope object, actually. Oh, there it is. Yeah. See, it has a name on it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. You know, I like that. It's another of my favorites. I wonder what a profile across that would look like. <clears throat> Are you asking me to do a profile across that? If you want to, Say sure. yes. Across? Or up? Yeah, I just, yeah, across the bright line. Okay, let's do that. It, it's like a cliff or a, a ridge or something. I know when it's lit from one side, it's dark. Yep. Uh, before full moon and then after full moon, it's uh, bright. Then you can see why. From the other side. You can see why. There you go. Because yeah, here, wow. it's high and then it drops down yeah. to there. So when the light is from the right, the uh, the slope there is dark. Yep. Before full moon and after full moon, it's being illuminated face on by the sun. So it's a bright line like we see here. Uh -huh. That's right. And so actually, there's always one of my favorite features. You can see that this is one of the times at this point. It was actually ah. done during that time. Yes. So you can see that this is before the full moon. Right, and if we uh, if we go out of this, I think we can. How do we? There's a way to minimize this. I'm trying to figure out where that is. Maybe this way. No. I really gotta do this. That's a bug. So if we do the same thing over here, now we cross this way. We're gonna see the same thing. Okay. Oh, you know what? It is the same thing, but it it okay. It's it went a different way. But it's still the same. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna. I, the reason I did that is because I started it uh, from here rather than here. Uh, All right. So let me just do it right. Okay. So if I start it from here and go across this way, now we're gonna see it the same way. Okay. So this is where we start. It comes across, and here the slope is in darkness because the light's coming from the right side. And it looks like it's looking at a big chasm, but it's not. It's just a cliff. Yeah. And how high a cliff? Well, here uh, we're at minus, uh, and again, uh, the mean radius of the moon, minus 1,589. And down the bottom, we're at minus uh, 1,875 or so. Um, so you can see that it drops quite a bit, you know, you know several hundred meters. You know, yeah, 18, 1872, uh, 15, so let's take 300, 300 meters. It's a 300 meter drop. <clears throat> now, you know. About a thousand feet. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just about. So that's actually a pretty good drop, you know. Uh, and so when we when we zoom in, we actually see the separate uh, elements of the data. And this here, you can see that you know this is indeed the light is coming from the right because we have the crater illumination here. This crater is interesting because it has a conical shadow. This tells you something about the shape of the crater. Okay, the crater is not a typical roundish crater, uh, and so that's kind of an interesting thing. It's also uh, it's also how the shadows would appear at that point, but you see how these are more uh, right. evenly dished. These are not because they're smaller and, and pointier uh, inside, which is kind of neat. <clears throat> okay. Um, man, did you send some questions? I did. Okay. Um. David just wanted you to go over something again. Um, it was on the last screen, I guess. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice here. Okay. Um, it was about a central ridge rather than a peak. He asked about it, but then he got a phone call from his daughter and missed the answer. So he was wondering if you could go over it again. It was the large crater that had been at the 3 o'clock position in the shot when you were showing the landing sites. Oh, it's boy. Been back a while. Yeah. So I wasn't exactly sure what he meant, but I just wanted to say he he wanted to know anyway. It was um, 
one of them had a central ridge rather than a peak. And David wanted to know if uh, that was unusual. That it, uh, that oh, it would have a central ridge rather than a peak. And if we could see it again. So, I don't know if you can find it, but... Hmm. Is it unusual? Well... Uh, central peaks have strange looks sometimes. They do have different looks. Okay, for instance... Uh, here... We see one... Um, here we see one a, a crater here that actually has, um, and this is a uh, patatus. This this is sort of like a, a standard central peak. But if you look at it closer, you see it has some elongation to it. It's a little bit longer, and that has to do with the the moment to moment changes in the lunar surface as the impactor was striking the surface and as the material. Uh, in the middle was being generated like that okay here on Tycho okay we see that the central peak has a fairly straightforward look but it also has some secondary uh, little appendages as well um, there's a lot of inconsistency in the material I should say not inconsistency per se but maybe uh, a lot of uh, non <laughs> how do I, okay non-homogeneous material so that it there's some that is denser than others more powdery uh, more thick and, and and dense and more resilient and resistant to change and that will cause the central peaks to look differently in different craters um now he may have been talking about copernicus and when we we're looking in copernicus earlier and when we look in copernicus okay you notice that you actually have uh kind of elongated peak here and a peak here that's sort of like they're separate they're kind of like uh, weirdly separate peaks say we have one here and one there one there in Copernicus it's the same thing okay these are all like unified as one central peak in the uh, 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 you know in the original moments that the crater was being made while we still had what was called the transient crater these are probably uh, unified, but as the rest of the uh, crater uh, continued to be formed uh, and lava oozed out and began filling the basin of this crater, any unification between this large central peak might have been split by lava filling in in between. So we could be looking at an area where uh, lava has filled in uh, kind of like islands now, whereas if you remove the water from uh, uh, around the islands that are like near each other you would, would see them as one unified uh, piece of land these might have been unified until the lava filled in and then over the next billion years obviously or, or several billion years we saw additional impactor strike inside uh, Copernicus so you know, a lot of this could be from that uh, so the chronology is important to, to study and I'm not sure exactly what the chronology of Copernicus is in particular. We just know that it has these shock uh, impact zones here, terraced ridges, uh, and you can see very clearly that these ridges are, are indeed fairly steep, and that has to do with the way this edge was made. If we actually look at this, let's say this to here. Okay, actually, let's go to... No, I don't want to go to here. I want to keep it right to there. So these two ridges, all right? You can see, all right, if we look at the data in detail, okay, you can see that um, up here on the top, all right, it was actually um, pretty... Uh, it, was, it was fairly uh, level up here. But then it drops off, and it drops down to... You know, minus 344, and it keeps going. Then there's another little peak, and that's like where the next terrace is, and that drops into the crater proper, or actually to the next layer, I should say, to minus 1400. So you can see that it's a big crater, uh, and a lot of, of material was uh, coming off. And, of course, there's a buildup to the edge, and then it drops off. You know, and it's fairly rapid drop-off, you know, in there. Um, so... The physics going on here, uh, when this was formed, actually, 
you know, how do central peaks form? Well, when the crater first hits, material is blown outward, okay? But the, the impactor continues to go down into the moon. It drills into the moon. And when it does that, um, there's a rebound effect, okay? And so material comes in from all sides and tries to refill the crater because what's happened is as this impact occurs, the soils and everything in here, again, this, this is the lava fill. That's, that's, we're not going to talk about that now. That that's, happens later. Um, but the soils inside here are uh, undergo liquefaction. So they act like, like a liquid for a period of time. They're not a liquid, but they act like a liquid. If you put on a big, uh, <laughs> if you put on a, 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 a shaking table and you put sand on it and then put a boat on the sand, it'll float like it's on water. Uh, if you sink it, then it'll sink in the sand like it's sinking in water because you're shaking the sand and you're turning it into a liquefaction um, uh, situation here. Well, similarly, this soils uh, and these impacts are liquefied and are made into like a, they act like a liquid. And so the material moves out and then it sloshes back. When it sloshes back, uh, central peaks rise up. This all happens in the fraction of a few seconds. And then after the initial impact is over, everything stops and everything stays and solidifies right where it is. Um, you get terraces here that are uh, immediate formations and you also get terraces formed from erosion from other impacts nearby that shake the moon and cause things to uh, drift and fall down. Okay, like we see, uh, you know, boulders and rocks and so forth. There's a lot of interesting features within Copernicus that uh, you can find by uh, staring at it uh, and looking it over. There's there's ridges that actually have uh, interesting boulders sitting on them. Okay, you can find uh, lines. Okay, shock lines from where the uh, the ground was shocked and subsided over time. Okay, these are cracks and terraces that actually form from uh, subsiding material that happened over time, <clears throat> and then. Uh, it goes on from there. There's there's tons and tons of these. Uh, and looking inside a crater like this, you can literally spend months. I mean, people spent years studying Copernicus. Just Copernicus. Just that one crater. Okay, because it was so filled with a rich assortment of amazing artifacts and uh, physics to look at. Just crazy, beautiful stuff. You know, so... Um, as far as I'm uh, concerned, I think that uh, we're looking at an uh, um, uh, extremely rich area that's actually uh, a lot of fun to look at. I could look at this and just, uh, you know, if I had Copernicus on a, only Copernicus, I could still be looking at it and doing whole streams just on Copernicus and the morphology of the rocks we see in here and how it's all come about. You know, this stuff has tumbled down these slopes. How do we know it's a slope? All we have to do is bring out our, our tool and measure the slope, you know. So let's go from here to here, okay, <clears throat> and see. We go from up top, and we go down the hill to here. And whenever you see a slope like that, what that tells you is you can look for boulder trails, and you can look to see if there's boulders that are falling down the hill, all right, we do see some linear features here. So there's some things that are falling down the hill. See, you can find them. They don't mention every single boulder trail that's on the moon. We can find them because we can see where these, these slopes are and look for uh, the boulders that have fallen downhill, for instance. So there's just so much to study, so much to see. Oh, man, it's beautiful. Anyway, um, I do want to... Uh, you know, give a, a, a shout out to everybody that's that's here in the uh, stream and in the chat. I want to say hello to Tana, who's here, Christopher Rupert, Dagger Spells, David Schmidt, uh, Dude W, Marco, Raymond B, and Ted Bronson. I think Ted is just heading out. Is he just? Did he just say good night? He's goodnight? just going to bed. Yeah. Okay. Well, good night, Ted. I wanted to give you a shout out before you went to bed. Um, and there's a number of other participants that have been uh, watching. We had a lot of people watching tonight. And oh, there were a lot of people watching. Uh, there were a few a few names uh, I only see from time to time saying hello once in a while, but 
there's still some shy people, but oh, that's uh, okay. like Michael was saying, he said, do you guys all know each other in here? Yeah, pretty much. Well, Hit the... subscribe and the bell and uh, join the community. All yeah, welcome. There's, 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 you know, a number of us know each other, but I'm always happy to see. Oh, you're welcome, Ted. Ted, thank me. Um, it's always wonderful to uh, see uh, people in here, like Dr. Mark from Texas. You, you weren't listed in the uh, in the uh, participant list, but you're definitely there. Um, so I want to thank you for coming uh, and and hanging out with us. Um, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> we're going to end the stream here pretty soon. Uh, We've looked at the uh, quick map once again. Uh, this is another version of it, brand new. And let me just uh, give you a quick overview one more time. Okay, we have these different projections. We have the near side. We have the far side. Uh, we have the south pole and the north pole. And then we have the lunar globe in 3D. And again, lunar globe in 3D is kind of fun. And if we go and look at the globe in 3D here, Okay, this is Copernicus in 3D, right? And now we can actually zoom in from the side, okay, and see Copernicus this way. Uh, and this is kind of fun, okay? We can also go below the surface of the moon, which we don't want to. That's uh, artificial. Uh, it's an error they have to capture. That's their issue. Um, but let's take a look now. If uh, Let me just bring this up again. <laughs> yeah, let me get up here. Come on, mouse. There we go. All right, let me just zoom out here. There we are. Okay, so, so coming back out now, uh, we went crazily far here. But the nice thing is, this is a, a nice 3D model, uh, of basically the moon. And <clears throat> if we zoom in, like like I said, the Copernicus now, we can actually kind of do this and kind of look at it at an angle which is neat uh, and we can just get rid of that no actually that's the way about and now watch this we can actually do this see this little button over here that's fly around the selected point well what point is that well we can click it and then we click on a point where we want to fly around let's say the center of Copernicus Ta -da! now we're moving around Copernicus uh, and this would be fun. Just leave it on your screen and let it go, man. You have a big screen. It's like, wow, you're going to circle Copernicus all night long. However, you can also zoom in as you're doing it and change the angle uh, of how you're looking at Copernicus. You know? Um, and that's kind of cool. I like that a lot. Yeah. Mark, could you make a, a three-dimensional globe of the moon, you know, with uh, with uh, terrain relief on it by 3D printing uh, tiles or gores, so to speak. Yeah, I actually already have. Um, oh. And uh, it's it's uh, four to five inches in diameter. I did it in two halves, um, and huh. I I printed one half and then the other half, <clears throat> uh, and it looks beautiful. Except that uh, it's it's not quite. Where I'd like it yet. There's there's more I can I can do with it, you know. Uh, so, yeah. So here you see now we're we're circling Copernicus, and you notice something interesting as we're circling Copernicus here, we're actually seeing data fill in. Now we can zoom faster, right? But this is like in the foreground. You see it moving past us right now, okay? Uh, and you'll see some data is it fills in slower, and f or faster. And so this is kind of what it looks like from Copernicus's rim, if you were on Copernicus's rim. Uh, and we can actually go a little lower, but, you know, we don't want to do that, okay? Uh, and get underneath it, all right? But that's kind of what it looks like. Isn't that neat? It is. Oh, yeah. We, it's just such a cool, cool view. And then when you want to stop rotating, you just click it off, all right? And now you're here, and then you can go back to using the other... Uh, tools to look around but look at this isn't this interesting how if you look at the moon correctly okay we, we're used to seeing copernicus and we think well you just see everything else when you see copernicus yeah that's not true okay if you get down to the level where you're looking at copernicus okay look at this okay uh you look around and look you, the curvature of the moon 
you only have Copernicus. That's all you see is Copernicus. If you're near Copernicus. Yet, we're used to seeing, like I said, we're used to seeing this, okay? As if we can see everywhere. And that's not true at all. Isn't that cool? And uh, and that's I actually one of the other ones I'll do. Um, I know I told you I was going to end the stream reels fast here, but I'm not. I'm going to do one other thing. Um, I'm going to go up to uh, Plato and uh, show you something else. Okay, so uh, if we go to Plato, watch this. Let's go into Plato. Okay, as we get into Plato and we, I didn't say Plato, I said Plato. Uh, if we come in here, okay, now within Plato, right, if we look around, again, same is true. All we see is Plato. You know, all we see is Plato. There's nothing else. Can you make a moon out of Plato? Uh, I've never tried. No? Make, not even when I, you were a little guy? Oh, <laughs> I probably did, but I probably made a, just a round ball, and I probably threw it at my sister. Blue and green? You probably, well, I probably made it out of green for green cheese or something. Yeah. So I made it, dinosaur <laughs> bones out of Play-Doh. Oh, that's Did cool. <clears throat> that's neat. I think I made snakes out of Play-Doh because I'm not very creative. <laughs> oh, I, everybody made snakes. <laughs> you put them down on the floor in front of the cat and they go, yeah. Here's another anyway. thing, too. I'll show you. This is a, like, when we look at, like, Mons Pico over here, okay? If we go to Mons Pico, right? Look at this. If you were at Mons Pico, could you see Plato? Well, there's Plato, right? If we're down here on the, on the floor, check it out. Okay, Mons Pico is here. This is the, this is the crater wall of Plato in the far distance. See that? Yeah. Even at the height, of Mons Plato, uh, Mons Pico, okay, we won't see Plato. You know, we won't see Plato. And what were those? The inside walls of the base inside the moon? Yes, exactly. Ay, ay, ay. And we'll hear, yes, see, NASA, NASA data was, uh, they were lying to us the whole time. <laughs> but see that? We so saw inside the base. That's what's interesting. You see around a spherical moon. So when you when you look, you see that there's, you know, nothing else visible, okay? Uh, only from a certain height, and, and only once you get to a certain height can you start to see this this wall of Plato. And look at this. This shows you just how uh, far above this surface uh, Plato is. Look at that. It's sort of like a mountain, and then the bottom here is higher than this base in here. You can see that. See that? This is lower than this. And you might say, well, how do, you, how do you know? Well, we do know because all we have to do is go to our tool that I keep telling you about and say, let's just do here to here. And watch what happens. Holy cow, we look at that. This is inside Play-Doh. Okay, and then we have the wall. And then look how far down it drops. Huh. Yeah, see that? So, again... This is an easy way to dispel that myth that uh, craters are all the same depth because those are certainly not all the same depth. Kind of you know, like a swimming pool. Is that not true? It's a moon pool. Oh, thank you very much. Psst, he's hot. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I think the the Martian rovers, uh, spirit and opportunity and... Yeah. Curiosity, I guess, uh, yeah. gave kind of similar views when they were approaching various craters. They did. Uh, you could only see the rim, you know, yep. and uh, uh, maybe Gale Crater. Or, yep. uh, what was the other one? Endeavor Crater? Yeah, well, there's, there was Victoria Crater. Remember when they were moving to Victoria? The, um, you could okay. just see the rim. Um, and, and you know what? Here's a question for the chat, if you guys uh, know about this. Where... Here on Earth, can we see the same thing where when we're down at the ground level, we can't see the crater, but we see just what looks like a mountain range, and that's actually the rim of the crater. We see that on Earth, too. I have a guess. I have a guess. I want to hear your guess. No. Well, no, I think a lot of other people have a turn. All right. I'm probably wrong. I, I'm just, I don't know why this came into my head, but... 
Hey, well, of course. we'll just, yeah, just wait on it. Begin with a Y. We'll just, let's, uh, why would you say uh, that? Uh, it does? No. No? Okay, no, no, I don't uh, know. I was thinking the same thing, though, Amanda. I bet I know what you were thinking. Yucatan? Oh, no, I was thinking yellow <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm well, talking I'm about a, a, a I'm talking about a, an impact crater. It's not it's not the uh, is, is it in Canada? No. So you're giving a lot of hints to folks now, but that's okay. Oh. It's okay. Um I, I can give the answer because, you know, I am not exp play. All right. Laura just guessed Yellowstone, so guesses are coming in. There's a bit of a lag. Okay. Meteor crater in Arizona? Whoa, that's Flames good. of War is saying either Mexico or South America. Are either of those right? No. No? Uh, D. Smith is saying Arizona. D. Smith is correct. Ooh! That's what I said. Uh, Meteor Crater? Behringer Crater? Yes, it's Behringer. Ooh! Yeah. D wins bragging rights. Yay! That's Congrats. right. Yeah, and, and when you're approaching it from Flagstaff... All you see is the rim of the crater. You don't even realize it's a crater until you get there and you go, wow, that's incredible. Now, I've actually never been there because it's sort of a tourist trap run by uh, private individuals who uh, are trying to kind of make you think it's a national monument by the signage they put up. But uh, it's a lie. It's not a national monument. National monuments don't cost you $18 or more a person to go in. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a little, but it's a little pet peeve. But you know what? It's okay. It was on private land, so I guess they're free to do what they want with it, right? Here's another thing for you. If we're in the middle of this this sea here, okay? Right, Pluto's there. A uh, Pluto, Pluto, Plato's there, and of course we have Copernicus down here. Uh, if we we're sitting in the middle of this sea, all right, check it out. The moon slopes away from us uh, long before we can ever see it in the distance that we're, you know, the uh, uh, Plato or anything. So we definitely have, uh, we definitely have a uh, uh, a moon that's a lot smaller than the Earth, or else it wouldn't slope away from us like that as much. <clears throat> but I am very excited that we did this tonight. Uh, I was going to actually stream tonight. Uh, with a telescope, and it turned out uh, that the clouds had other the plans. The clouds had other plans, and man, that just took the wind out of my sails. I thought, oh man, I want to stream. And Daryl, uh, to his credit, suggested, well, a cloudy night stream or something like that. It was you, right, that said that? Yeah. Daryl did. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. It's Don't sound okay, so enthusiastic. Girl. It's all my fault. <coughs> no, we actually... no, hey, I thought this was great tonight. I've been enjoying every bit of this. Yeah, we've it had, a, we've had, a, we had, had a... so many amazing questions from chat. Just, they were on fire tonight. They were. They were. They were on fire, and I want to thank you guys. Um, so just remember, um, it's the Quick Map Browser. If you have questions, you can ask me. I'm happy to help you. These tools on the left are very important. The three bars bring up the layers. Uh, which is sort of standardized with apps on the iPhone and other apps that you know that have the three bars that mean layer. They mean layers uh, or further menus. Um, and so uh, the one that you want most of all is probably overlays. Okay, overlays will give you the nomenclature, which are the uh, which we don't see here on the 3D map. Um, let me just go back to one where you see it just so we can do it. Okay, all right. But overlays will show us uh, the names. Right, and you have all these different projections. Okay, so uh, under the menus, overlays is probably a big one for you, and under that, nomenclature. You can also set the opacity of the level so you can see the names very, very lightly or very, very uh, brightly. Okay, lightly or brightly, your call. All right, now, and uh, it has almost 10,000 names uh, in the database. And if you're looking for a particular crater, you can then go ahead and type the name in. You can also see what you can look for. You can look for an albedo feature. That's something bright. You, look, you can look for uh, the Apollo landing sites. You can look for these features, craters. You can look for any dorsa, 
uh, or Lakers or uh, landing sites by their name, uh, Maria, um, mountains, uh, uh, ocean, you know, oceans uh, and, and seas, uh, and so forth and so on, rims and rupees uh, and so forth. And uh, you can do them by name or you can just uh, put in those words and get all of them or most of them. So it's really kind of neat uh, to do that, all right, to, to be able to do that uh, filtering this way. So then, I'm, yeah? I, I got to ask, I don't know, if I have a timestamp, is there any way you can go back in a video and look at something? Uh, right now? Yeah, at the end of the stream. I'd have to wait for the stream to be processed up on YouTube. Oh, uh, okay. But yes. Okay, that's what I was wondering. I wasn't sure. Okay. Okay. Sorry, okay. David. Oh, what did he ask? Oh, he wanted you to go back and look at that crater again. Uh, oh. It was the one by the lunar lander. Okay, well, if he's got um, if he's got the time and date, then we can do that. Or the, or the other. He, he has the timestamp. Yeah, the timestamp, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, 23.47.01. I have a request. Okay. Maybe to end the show on. Uh, you can pull up the current lunar phase, can't you? Show the people what the, the moon actually looks like right now. Yes, as of a matter of fact. It's set for most of us already, but... Uh, yeah, no, I can. In fact, uh, and that's under overlays. Yeah. And if we just take off nomenclature and man-made features, with their, which are anthropogenic features, um, and... We keep scrolling down. We have one called Sunlit Region, and I'll be back out. And now if you want to know what the moon looks like now, then you can look at this approximation. It doesn't accurately shadow the craters. Let me just tell right up front. It just shows you the other. Just get rid of this. It just shows you the general location, and there it is. Uh -huh. Okay. It doesn't really show you the, the shadows. If you want to see the shadows, then there's another website to go to, which will will feature on another stream. <clears throat> where you can actually see uh, the exact phase, the features. Is it starting to wax? It is waxing, well, yes. It is waxing. Ooh. I oh, swear to God, I was going to say, I was out last night? The night before. I can't remember. And it wasn't too dark, but just dark enough, and I could see a tiny little sliver of a crescent moon, and I was uh -huh. going to say it actually looked less than what we're looking at now. Yep. So I thought if it was waxing, then it will be filling in. And Very good. Brighter. See, yep. uh, now she, she's actually synthesizing Applying. responses. Yes, yeah, she's... Applying learned knowledge. That is right. So that's how we do the sunlit side, okay, like that. But unfortunately, if we do that, then when we come down here, you see we're in shadow, and you're not going to see yeah. a whole lot of things. So that that's, that's useful for a second to be able to see where things are, okay? Well, um, thank you. No, that's fine. That's a great... Uh, a great That's question. Painful. So yeah, now well. you can see like we have uh, the featured images still selected, but you just go down the list and start enjoying some of the things you can see here. Okay. Um, yeah, David wants to know uh, when he goes to layers and he selects an option, how does he get it to apply? Oh, you have to click this little box. I'll show you. Look at this. Uh, geologic features. Okay. Uh, craters, 5 to 20 kilometers. If I click that, okay, you see that little blue dots appear, right? And the craters, for instance, that are 5 to 20 kilometers in size show up on the on the image. See these? This has a blue uh, uh, ring around it, and it's because it is one of those craters, okay? So you just click the, uh, the, the, the little bubble next to it. Uh, Craters greater than 20 kilometers and so forth. And down here, you can see more stuff. Um, craters that are uh, tied to the uh, uh, the making of Copernicus. Okay. If we look back out here, you'll see that a few of them are actually tied to the actual making of Copernicus. Uh, that is to say that perhaps they had... Uh, they happened at a time when Copernicus was made, All right? Um, and that's from a, from ejecta from Copernicus. Uh, yeah, it could have been ejecta. <clears throat> I'm not sure if if there were 
uh, multiple strikes at the same time from, say, a body uh. that was broken apart by the uh, gravitational force of, say, the Earth and torn apart, you know, uh, tidally, the tidal forces could have torn something apart. Just like Shoemaker-Levy, a comet was right. ripped apart by Jupiter into a long string of impactors, uh-huh. you know, which would happen to us, too, if we uh, had a a comet that was coming near us. We'd probably rip it apart, too, a little bit. Um, so anyway. There are some chain impacts on the moon, are there not? There are. There are, and I don't know if we actually have those in uh, in here. Let's see if we do. Oh, well, that's okay. We don't have to do that tonight. I know you're trying to wrap the stream. That's fine. Uh, but, you know, areas like, for instance... Uh, like Mark needs an excuse to keep going. I know, right? <laughs> so there's, our, there's areas on the moon uh, uh, like this that are called swirls. Uh, and these are interesting because they're areas of mixed material. See that? And if we remove the uh, borders, you can actually see it. See that? Huh. Isn't huh. that wild? And, and you know, they don't really, they don't look really uh, crazy. The contrast on this is actually pretty good to show it. But when you get down to this level, you don't really see a difference, do you? But when you pop out, you do. Um, and what are those from? Well, those are from different types of lava that were flowing on the surface. Okay, this is different from this, okay, which may all be different from this. Uh, and <clears throat> maybe it was density, maybe it was the amount of, of certain minerals in this particular lava versus this. Um, but in the end, the moon and the earth actually have very similar composition. Very, very similar composition, you know. Um, we actually have other uh, uh, geologic features that we we see here on the Earth too, <coughs> like this. These are lobate scarps. These are uh, these are areas where you can see material uh, that uh, see coming out this far. You may not really see it. You got to kind of have the sun angle at just the right angle to show you. These are. Let me just remove this here a bit. So you can actually see right here, this has got this, this really interesting appearance. Oh, of course, it happens to be a low-density data right there, <laughs> low-res data. Um, but, you know, again, you can go through this to find all the ones, you know, uh, wrinkle ridges, too. We saw uh, several of them actually earlier. And these are... Okay, these are in, in good data. You can see a ridge there. Okay, and if you want to know anything about wrinkle ridges, the first thing you want to know is, are they depressions or are they raised? And if we do this, you'll see, okay, that the wrinkle ridges are actually these raised areas, okay? All right, it looks like it's a depression, okay, right there. It's actually a raised area, see? Very fascinating stuff. Um, and, again, that's why they're called ridges. Uh, but... This is again something to uh, to go ahead and explore when you do this. Uh, either way, I just want to uh, make sure that I make it clear to all of you that I've had a wonderful time doing the. Uh... Can I ask another question before we go? Sure. It's a good question. I hope it's not too complex to this... answer. Well, I mean, I'm fine. sure science figures it out, but. Um... And it's interesting because I didn't really understand where he was coming from at first. I think it's okay. a he. Uh, but Flames of War wants to know, um, when they launch a rocket into space, what keeps the Earth from leaving the rocket behind? And at first I didn't really understand what they meant, but they were saying, since we're traveling through space thousands of miles an hour, if you launch a rocket into space, shouldn't we therefore be be leaving the rocket behind? <clears throat> no. Which it, is a really awesome question. Now that I see where they're coming from, that's really really awesome. Yeah, and the answer is no, and and that has to come that that comes to uh, a different discussion, which is about uh, you for for the same reason that if you jump into the air, the Earth doesn't rush under your feet past you because you're going into the air. Okay. Um, See, the way it works is you're, you and the Earth are moving at the same speed. When you jump up into the air, 
Well, you're being held back by gravity on this planet, of course. And as you jump into the air, you're still moving at the same speed as the Earth. You know? And when rockets launch into space... Because gravity is moving you at the same time? No, not gravity. In the air? Not gravity. Oh. The rotation, the angular momentum, the angular velocity, uh, the omega of, of the Earth, that, that velocity of the Earth. You're moving at the same speed the whole time. You're moving at over 1,000 miles an hour right now, even though you're sitting down in your chair. Okay, and if you jumped into the air, you jump into the air moving a thousand miles an hour. The air is moving a thousand miles an hour. The entire planet is moving a thousand miles an hour. Okay, so when we launch rockets, we launch in the direction the Earth's rotating. Why is that? Because it gets us a thousand miles an hour right off the bat of additional velocity that we have. We don't have to make that up if we go the other way. Uh, it's not to say that we haven't done that. We have launched in the other direction before. And to go polar, go over the North and South Poles. But we actually, um, uh, we launch in the same direction the Earth's rotating so that we actually have that 1,000 miles an hour boost right off the bat. Uh, it really uh, makes, you know, makes launching easier. It makes it easier to actually acquire the right orbital speed um, by a little bit. So it's kind of cool, you know? That's very cool. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so, you know, when a rocket launches off the Earth, it's moving at the initial speed of 1,000 miles an hour with the Earth in it. it. It angles in the direction that the Earth's rotating and goes horizontally quite a bit in order to uh, achieve orbital velocity. That is to say, the speed at which it can go such that it can stay in a circular orbit around the Earth. So as it moves forward, the Earth's trying to pull it down but it's moving forward fast enough so that it continues at the same altitude over the Earth. Even though it's being pulled down to the Earth, it's actually moving horizontally such that it won't fall back to the Earth. So it's controlled falling, basically. Uh, and that's why astronauts are uh, weightless in orbit as well, because they're constantly falling, yet in a circular manner thanks to balancing gravity with that horizontal velocity. You know, so yes, and, and, you know, and in addition to the rotation speed of 1,000 miles an hour, we're also moving around the sun at a certain velocity, and the moon's moving around the earth at a certain velocity. Uh, and if you looked at our orbits, if you looked at the orbit of the moon as it goes around the earth throughout the time that the, the moon and the, and the earth uh, go around the sun, You'd notice that as the Earth is moving around the Sun and the Moon is moving around the Earth, we actually would see kind of a corkscrew kind of orbit. Um, and it's really the geometry of what happens in the orbits is really fascinating. Uh, and then you have to add the fact that the Sun itself is moving around the galaxy. And the motion of the Sun is carrying the planets with it. And uh, so the gravity of the Sun is you know, carrying the planets with it. And we get the same kind of thing. We get a corkscrew upon a corkscrew upon a corkscrew as we, you know, the moon to the earth to the sun. Uh, and it's really very complicated looking. But if we didn't have uh, the physics that told us to look at just the reference frame, that frame in which we exist that we're observing from, um, in other words, from the earth, say, then we would end up really being uh, overwhelmed with the thought of trying to calculate, say, the speed at which the moon goes around the Earth, or the speed at which the Earth goes around the sun, or the rotation rate of the Earth. It's crazy. Um, but that all said, I am going to cut it uh, for the night. I do want to thank you guys for coming out. Thank a, you for answering all the questions. Oh, thank I, you, I Chad, love it. for asking them all. Actually, Thank this was, you, Daryl, for your lovely analogies and yeah. your kind way. Oh, well, sure. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course, Joe. I had, had great fun tonight. You're always hey. welcome. And I think, you know, I'm based on some of the, 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 the little wonderment you expressed a few times, I think I showed you a few things you didn't know, Daryl. You did. I'm very Absolutely impressed. Absolutely. Very pleased. Did. Very happy to see that. Well, guys, no uh, folks, I want to thank you very much for joining me on Sky, and, and Daryl and, and Amanda on Sky Tour live stream tonight. Uh, what was going to start as a star stream ended up being a cloudy night stream uh but i do want to thank you all for uh hanging in here and and having a lot of fun with us we had a good time uh you know uh so that said i am going to just 
uh, leave us with uh, little tunes as we fade everything out and make our way back to uh, reality here. I'm going to take off the blue lights. Don't forget to spring forward, everyone. Yes, you got to set the clocks ahead, folks. If you have it's a already, cell phone, it's it'll... already sprung forward on me. Yes. I feel you... warmer already, closer to spring. Yeah. Well, if you have it a cell phone, it will automatically be too. done for you. Uh, it looks like mine was already done. It says it's 136. <laughs> yeah. But... In a half hour, it'll be three, though, for you. <clears throat> Well, it's uh, I hate daylight savings time. <laughs> it, it's after midnight here already, so. Yeah, it usually happens at two, doesn't it? Oh well, maybe so. Okay, yeah, I, you'll see. Yeah, I'll let, I'll see. I'll let you know what my cell phone tells me. Anyway, folks, thank you so much for coming. Um, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, thanks, Flames of War, for the question, and all the rest of you for the question, and for you guys that uh, donated. I am humbly uh, your servant forevermore. This, you guys are fantastic, and I want to thank you for doing so. Uh, you really make Sky Tour live stream what it is by being here, and you know, um, Daryl and Amanda, you guys are adding immeasurably to the experience. I think of everybody that comes here, and I want to thank you too as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, you folks have a good night. And we will talk to you soon. Good night. And remember, night. keep looking night, up. Good night, everybody. Keep looking up, folks. Except while you're driving. There you go. <laughs> <laughs>